uh, to really support this important webinar series. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Montano is our uh, public uh, education guru uh, uh, as we are moving into areas in public education that we were maybe a little bit marginal and now we are trying to be more centered. Uh, the prospect of really making teacher prep inclusive of ethnic studies is just absolutely exciting. Uh, I know we want to do something, something to stop the uh, school to prison pipeline, and we need to have teachers in the classroom who are culturally competent to teach our students, and particularly, uh, for me at least, I have a bias, our brown and black boys who I think are just being lost in the schools at this particular point. So if we can infuse teacher prep and make a connection with ethnic studies uh, on our campuses, then I think that helps all of us. You know, ethnic studies is always fighting to survive. We're fighting to survive now. Uh, we are trying to get this ethnic studies requirement, and it's as though everyone has been fighting us left and right on it, uh, when it should be a no-brainer. So I am just pleased that uh, Dr. Lopez and Dr. Montano pulled this together. I am happy to see all of the participants here. Uh, we need your expertise and experience. We need to be able to chart ways to actually make what really will become um, a structural change in teacher prep uh, and, and in ethnic studies. So those are the only words I have for today. I'm just so uh, grateful and proud of your work. I look forward to where this goes. Uh, we have a series of webinars. Uh, you were able to do this in spite of COVID-19. So I just want to thank you all and welcome you and know that you have CFA support in moving uh, this work forward. That's all, thank folks. You, this is my fourth Zoom today, and I think I've got two more, three more to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Charles. Um, Charles is the president of the California Faculty Association and uh, a professor of Africana Studies at San Diego State University and has been um, really supportive of our efforts. We, we do want to begin with a land uh, acknowledgement. Um, want to um, thank our, um, our ancestors and the spirits of those who came before us that um, uh, uh, whose stolen lands we um, sit in today. Um, each of us is, this is a statewide effort, so I'm sure that you are, um, you can acknowledge the peoples and land and the lands who you are um, situated in. For me, it's the Tatavanian, um, Chumash, and um, uh, uh, peoples, and I I'm eternally grateful for the the lessons that they've left. And hopefully, once we're out of the COVID nineteen. Um, as stewards, uh, we can um, maintain the land and the environment and the way that they would have desired. So I, I'm gonna, um, my name is Teresa Montano and along with Patricia Lopez, we have been uh, the, uh, along with her colleagues, um, have put this thing together. I'm gonna begin with a presentation about um, how we see this, our overview. And I'm going to begin by um, saying that for decades, uh, students and faculty advocated for the inclusion of ethnic studies as a legitimate academic discipline, even holding hunger strikes, rallies, and sit in. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the battle for ethnic studies was led primarily by high school students and college students. However, it was a coalition of educator and community activists that ultimately led to the establishment of ethnic studies in US schools and colleges. At present, the implementation of ethnic studies is rapidly moving forward. As colleges and universities, we must prepare to graduate the next generation of ethnic studies educators. In 2016, Governor Jerry Brown signed AB 2016, which if properly executed, while arguably controversial, will develop a model ethnic studies curriculum. 
The curriculum will be aligned to the instructional standards so that school districts could adopt and implement a course in ethnic studies. The Instructional Quality Commission's adoption of the final version is considered by some a necessary step in the adoption of an ethnic studies requirement in K-12 schools. However, given the number of school districts already adopting a required course in ethnic studies, the need to prepare the next generation of ethnic studies teachers is even more critical. In our capacity as college faculty, we hear early educators lament that their content knowledge in ethnic studies is very limited. An informal poll of prospective teachers yielded the fact that 10% of future teachers feel that they are not prepared to teach ethnic studies. And this informal poll taken in ethnic studies courses included teachers of English and social studies. This is a concern. To implement a solid curriculum in ethnic studies in any K-12 setting, we need educators who have knowledge of ethnic studies content, epistemology, and pedagogy. A quick review of our credentialing process will reveal that we are not prepared to meet this stipulation. In California, secondary teachers are required to have an undergraduate foundation in one of several content areas, math, social studies, English, language arts, etc. A strong major presumes that a teacher would have a strong background in a given area, ensuring California students are taught by educator with subject matter expertise. However, as measures are taken to implement ethnic studies for every California student, many of our graduates are missing the critical components of both ethnic studies and a critical, culturally sustaining, responsive pedagogy. While diversity, social justice, or multicultural courses cannot substitute for ethnic studies, Together, these intersectionalities can significantly deepen student engagement, voice and agency, humanize student learning, and democratize instruction. Moreover, given the high percentage of bilingual and emerging bilingual students in this state, additional factors such as graduating bilingual teachers is also important. As unionists, activist scholars, and teacher educators, we maintain that it is not only our responsibility to develop a seamless pathway into teaching for ethnic studies majors, but to join the battle for ethnic studies. Ethnic studies was born of struggle. And believe me, it will take a struggle to win. The struggle to establish ethnic studies in our schools and institutions of higher education are inextricably linked. Teachers were critical partners and in many cases helped design and teach some of the first courses in ethnic studies in our colleges and universities. Likewise, ethnic studies faculty partnered with faculty in colleges of education to make sure that ethnic studies and critical multiculturalism became a significant component in many teacher education programs. These programs were aimed at increasing the diversity of teacher candidates, increasing the number of teachers of color, and democratizing the curriculum in both public schools and colleges. Nevertheless, while our student population is overwhelmingly students of color, teachers remain predominantly white. Ethnic studies can be the venue for diversifying the workforce. We must develop programs targeted at the recruitment and retention of candidates of color. This will require critical partnerships for the collective development of policy and legislation whereby both ethnic studies and teacher education departments and programs not only affirm and respect our students' cultural and linguistic capital in their classroom, 
but also accept the shared responsibility of helping historically underserved students succeed in the teaching profession. To that end, the California Faculty Association, the Crimmins School of Education and Human Development at CSU Fresno, K-12 teachers, community college, and CSU faculty initiated this series of webinar where we hope to initiate a dialogue on questions like, number one, what is ethnic studies? Why is ethnic studies necessary? How do we develop a curricular model that is aligned to the several disciplines that comprise it? Who determines this definition? How does ethnic studies differ from the multicultural social justice or diversity requirements many institutions are advocating for? Two, what will it take to develop and design a statewide programmatic response to the question of ethnic studies teacher preparation in higher education? One that ensures the totality of ethnic studies, undergraduate education, and a strong credential option? How do we ensure that secondary education faculty are collaborating with ethnic studies faculty to construct these programs? Ethnic studies requires a strong connection to the community. How do we guarantee activism, community building, and critical contemporary issues impacting our respective communities of color are incorporated into early field experiences for our students. Will future educators need a credential, a strong undergraduate major, or both? And three, what about those already teaching? How do we collaborate to ensure that teachers with a strong background in ethnic studies and culturally sustaining pedagogy are the first to teach these courses? Will they have the materials, resources, and curriculum development opportunities establish a sound critical program. And what about those teachers not in secondary education, social studies, or English, who wish to infuse ethnic studies in their curricular program? I want to thank Patricia Lopez for her tireless work on this project, and the members of Enseñamos del, en el Valle Central and Ethnic Studies Educators from Fresno for planning this series of webinar. I wanna thank my union, the California Faculty Association, for their support of this project and their unwavering commitment to social and racial justice. And thank you, thank you, thank you to the many Ethnic Studies advocates, educators, and scholars who accepted our invitation. As a planning committee, it was our hope to bring together ethnic studies faculty grounded in critical pedagogy, secondary teacher educators with a strong background in ethnic studies, experienced teachers of ethnic studies, union leaders focused on social justice issues in communities of color, policymakers who were ethnic studies majors, and other critical allies in the battle for ethnic studies. Each of us represents our profession and our distinct racialized communities of color, now collapsed into one discipline by virtue of legislation and circumstance. This is only the first of several gatherings. We know that there are several innovative projects, programs, and ideas yet to be presented. Therefore, continuing this collective work is so, so, so important. In the short time we have worked on this, we've seen strong undergraduate programs, credential options, community programs, and professional development collaboratives. Our goal is to begin an ongoing dialogue on the questions posed above by first showcasing several initiatives, deepening discussion on the content, epistemology, and pedagogy of ethnic studies, and collectively identifying policy, practices, legislation, and action that could move this state towards securing a teacher workforce prepared and qualified to teach ethnic studies to California students. Welcome to our first webinar and our first panel. 
After each panel, we have allowed for a few minutes of Q&A. And on that note, it gives me a tremendous amount of pleasure uh, to introduce our first panel, which will address issues of policy, give us updates about what's happening with uh, ethnic studies curriculum, challenges and promises. We have three varied perspectives from varied points of view. Uh, someone from the State Department, community college faculty, and a K-12 teacher who was a member of the Model Curriculum Advisory Committee. Cindy Uralte is a policy advisor to the State Superintendent of Public Instruction at the California State Department of Education. And she ser currently serves as an advisor to the State Super Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. Lupe Carrasco Cardona, a member of Unión del Barrio, a former member of the committee that developed the ethnic studies model curriculum, an activist in the Association of Raza Educators, and a curriculum developer and professional development deliverer of ethnic studies, and Matthew Espinosa Watson, who is, uh, holds a doctorate in Jewish prudence from uh, UC Berkeley, and is a professor of Chicana Latino Studies at Fresno City College. Matt is currently grappling with issues of diluted, uh, attempts to dilute our uh, ethnic studies curriculum uh, through ethnic social justice rhetoric. Um, and he's going to shed a light on how important it is to address these issues in the community college, because it remains the um, institution of higher education where most of our students of color first enter the system. So on that note, thank you, and I will turn it over to Cindy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. This is, I'm still getting used to the whole Zoom meeting conference, so thank you. Um, as I that was, I was introduced, um, policy advisor, state superintendent, Tony Thurman, but I think more importantly in this conversation, I'm a Chicano Studies graduate, you know, and to me it's very important as we approach this work in this conversation around um, ethnic studies, what it means, the importance of having it, the impact that it can have on our students in California. I can share my personal story. When I started Fresno City College at um, June 2010, um, I definitely came to the campus with a very similar experience to many of our students that, that go through the K through 12 system and find themselves in community college and, and not really being able to find my way. And to me, Chicano Studies and Mecha was my way. You know, professors that really mentored me and guided me through this process. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. And I'm very humbled to be here today um, to speak with you about the plans that we have for ethnic studies, what we've been doing, and um, to provide some guidance. Um, I wanna thank everyone who's been involved in coordinating today. I wanna thank um, the folks from the past um, advisory committee who have poured a lot of work and energy into keeping this work alive and um, seeing the course because we know that their hearts are in the right place to guide uh, California students. Superintendent Thurman has been very clear in his support for closing the achievement gap and he believes in the importance of having educators that look like the students of California to represent their interests and help support them and guide them through cultural um, responsiveness and pedagogy that it will help their students see them through to reach their full potential. Um, I'm here today to really talk with you about the next steps in that process that was outlined originally by um, Dr. Montaño um, regarding the Instructional Quality Commission the Instructional Quality Commission had discussed um, the timelines that have been updated as a result of COVID-19. We're in this space now where we have, we're have we scheduling to sometime late summer to have that conversation regarding what ethnic studies um, the model curriculum will look like. However, we're still receiving public comments through our ethnic studies mailbox at ethnic studies at cde.ca.gov, which I can share with all of you in the chat, as well as the um, resources post event. Um, 
Superintendent Thurmond has been very clear up front that he believes that ethnic studies should stick to the foundational groups of Chicano Latino studies, African American studies, Asian American studies, as well as Native American studies. And understanding that we need to focus on the um, experiences of students of color um, throughout the state. So understanding that, and as we go through the public process, um, knowing that the process is still taking place, but the timelines are a bit different now considering we're going through COVID-19 um, and really trying to um, respond to the public health crisis. Um, we are still receiving comments and want to make sure we're getting all voices in that process. Um, we stand committed around social justice, around closing the achievement gap, and making sure that our students are getting the supports that they need, especially our teachers. So uh, you have an ally with you here at the Department of Education who's really trying to lead the way as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, uh, Lupe Carrasco. Thank you, Cindy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So as Teresa said earlier, um, I'm a K through 12 educator. I've been a teacher for 20 years and I've, um, I'm credentialed to teach social studies and um, English. And within that, I've taught you know, several different courses and always um, in their ethnic studies as well. I'm currently um, teaching at Roy Ball Learning Center for the Los Angeles Unified School District. I am uh, the proud Praxis Chair of the Association of Raza Educators Los Angeles a proud member of Union del Barrio. And I've also participated in the, or I am currently participating in the um, CTA Stanford Instructional Leadership Corps. And, um, and as you know, what pertains to today, I'm a former member of the um, AB 2016 Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Advisory Committee for um, the state of California. So to, to be a member of that was such a beautiful experience. It was extremely humbling. Um, that, you know, out of all of the applicants in the state of California, I was one of 18 um, chosen to serve on that. Um, there were extremely amazing um, individuals that were a part of that group. It was actually a very beautiful experience to be in a room with folks that were um, leading the work from Northern California to Southern California, Central California and beyond, um, representing the four racialized ethnic groups, um, including white allies. It was, um, honestly, it was, um, one of the best uh, experiences I've had in terms of being able to impact um, legislation. Um, so I'm, I'm really extremely um, proud of the work that we did, um, but I also want to say that um, we were given very limited uh, time constraints to be able to, um, to advise the curriculum. Um, we consistently um, voiced the concern to the, to the state, um, to the CDE, that um, we were not comfortable with the, um, the two days um, in February of 2019, two days in March of 2019, and two days in April of 2019 um, to be able to do um, justice um, for an ethnic studies uh, model curriculum. And uh, we were also concerned with the fact that, um, that we were con like constantly told that the um, legislative timeline had already been set and that there was really nothing that could be could be done. The AB 2016 um, timeline had been set, but we know that um, since then um, the timeline was adjusted, not because of our asking. And then now we're hearing that the COVID-19, um, which is completely understandable, would also adjust the timeline. But when we were asking for for that um, extension or to be given more time, more days, more hours to be able to work on it, we were um, not able to do so. And so, um, so we worked. February, March, and April, and then in, um, in May, the Instructional Quality Commission received our final uh, draft, you know, final-ish, I want to say, because as I said before, we were not able to have enough time to do all of the things we knew it needed to have um, done to it, um, and they made some uh, minor adjustments, they approved it, and then it went to public comment. And it went to public comment. Um, it was relatively quiet for a while. And then all of a sudden there was the big um, like commotion and the pushback that um, could be seen, you know, internationally, definitely nationally um, uh, against the model curriculum. 
And so um, there is a myth that the uh, model curriculum was widely criticized. Um, we know that it wasn't widely criticized. We just know that those who criticized were um, very large in their, in their scope, in their media scope. They were very well funded. And um, there was, um, you know, um, it ranged from, you know, right wing white nationalists at Breitbart to the Wall Street Journal, uh, white capitalists who, you know, also deny the climate crisis and right now are even denying um, some of the dangers around COVID-19. And, and then also what we saw was that there were white moderates who superficially said that they supported ethnic studies, but then said that they wanted ethnic studies to be taught their way. And many of these um, resistors to the, the draft that we had put together were, um, were, as I said before, extremely well funded, but um, at the same time, they were, um, they were blowing it up to a larger scale. We ourselves had, um, we recognized that during the public comment, there were reasonable requests for changes. We agreed with the reasonable requests. We knew that things were missing. We knew that, um, that more needed to be added. It needed to be more thorough, but, um, but the, the, it just got completely blown out of proportion. And so um, one of the, um, the facts is that in actuality, there is a um, vast support in favor of the ethnic studies model curriculum draft um, within the state of California, um, within the context of ethnic studies from many community-based organizations like the Association of Raza Educators for one, um, and many institutions throughout the state of California with combined memberships of over 500,000 people. And so I'm gonna just kind of, um, I'm gonna show really quickly a, um, a list of some of these organizations that have signed on in support of the draft. Um, so we have the members of the AB 2016 Model Curriculum Committee, of course. Um, I'm just gonna kind of uh, just jump around. We've got the Asian American Political Alliance. We've got the Asian Law Alliance. We've got uh, Black Lives Matter, Long Beach, Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Diego, Black Male Institute, UCLA. Um, and we kind of scroll down. We've got California Teachers Association, California State University, Northridge American Indian Student Association. And then the list goes on and on. And the list that I'm providing for you right now is not a thorough and complete list. This is um, a list that needs to be revised as soon as, as possible so that you can have a more accurate um, viewing of the support that we indeed have um, in the state of California. So let me go back to our presentation. Another fact is that um, the ethnic studies model curriculum draft is already in use in many classrooms and in uh, various PDs for teachers throughout the state of California and beyond. Um, even though it's not the official California Department of Education uh, model curriculum at this point, um, you know, it's, it's trusted, it was, it was written by, um, you know, practitioners and scholars from K through 12 and beyond, um, as I said before, from throughout the state. And so I'm gonna go ahead and give you some specific examples of um, how it's being used right now throughout the state of California. So um, as I said before, um, I'm a member of the CTA Stanford Instructional Leadership Corps. Um, and so through the Instructional Leadership Corps, um, that is a, an, an organization that is creating PD for teachers by teachers. And so there's already professional development that is, um, that is implementing things like the courses, the course outlines, the, um, the templates for um, creating lesson plans, the, uh, the templates for creating units, and of course the ethnic studies model curriculum guiding values, principles, and outcomes of ethnic studies teaching. Um, and so, so we see that there um, are folks in diverse locations throughout the state um, that are already citing those um, ethnic studies guiding principles and that are already using it to guide their own local and regional um, uh, curricular development. And uh, we see that the, um, many of the advisory committee members who were, who were and are extremely influential as leaders in their um, respective you know, districts, their respective universities, in their communities. They are also providing um, PD across the state of California from San Diego to Los Angeles, San Francisco to Seattle, and even to Boston and beyond. And then um, the Are Praxis series. So um, I'm a, um, uh, I've been, I was the chair of the Association of Raza Educators Los Angeles for several years, and I'm currently the Praxis chair. 
and we are um, annually, we're on our fifth annual Audit Praxis Institute. Um, I shared right here the, the flyer for our Praxis Institute for um, this summer, which of course will be held virtually. It's usually held in Echo Park and it, um, it ranges from three to four days. Um, we've uh, drastically um, altered it for this, um, for this situation. But um, nonetheless, the Audit Praxis series or the Audit Praxis Institute was created um, to um, provide professional development opportunities for teachers without relying on the state, without relying on the districts, without relying on um, you know, uh, watered down versions of curriculum. So uh, something about Audit Praxis Institute is that we do, it's, it, we do not just the ethnic studies, not just the critical um, you know, uh, pedagogy, but also the organizing element, how to, be, how to get students to, yes, become uh, activists and organizers. I know that that was a comment that was made in response to the ethnic studies model curriculum draft, is that um, teachers should not be um, training students to become activists and organizers. And um, we strongly believe that that's not the case. Uh, we strongly believe that our students need to be transformative, that students need to understand um, the systems in place in order to become positive um, agents of change. And we know right now COVID-19 has made it more obvious than ever before that there are systems in place that are um, unequal and that um, and we would be extremely proud for our students to come through the pipeline and to be the ones to change those systems. So yes, that's what we do with um, the Audit Praxis Institute is we, we, um, we accept teachers, uh, usually younger, newer teachers to the profession, but we've had also seasoned teachers come through and then they become members of Audit and then they become um, you know, future Praxis Institute faculty. Um, but that is something that we believe very strongly in. And so we believe that this is an issue of racial and educational justice. Um, all of the teachers that were on that model um, curriculum advisory committee, and that's not even including the amazing curriculum writers, right, um, have thousands, collectively have thousands of hours of uh, teaching and curriculum development experience. And to allow oppressive uh, whiteness to in any way control what ethnic studies is and needs to be for our students and all students is a, is a grave injustice, it's, it's racist. And that's why we continue to do this work um, the work that has been done um, for the last 50 years. And, and as Teresa said earlier with the, um, the opening, when we're saying thank you to the, um, the stewards of this land and thank you to our ancestors, I wanna say thank you to the folks that have spent the last 50 years in struggle for us to have this critical ethnic studies. And, um, and we, we're continuing, we're gonna continue the fight. And lastly, I just wanna say we need to liberate ethnic studies. Um, you know, there are many scholars from throughout the state from the four racialized ethnic groups who um, want to come together to ensure that there is a model curriculum available for, um, for students, for teachers, that is critical, that, that upholds the ethnic studies um, model curriculum guiding values, principles, and outcomes of ethnic studies teaching. And we want to ensure that we do not eliminate the Arab American and Palestinian voice in any matter. We're all in this together. Thank you so much for this time. And Matt, um, you are a final presenter on this panel and we are making very good time. Thank you, presenters. All right, thank you. Um, just wanna again, thank our, our organizers for inviting me to be part of this. I wanna thank the other panelists who have presented so far. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different um, turn in a sense because my focus is not gonna be on um, the the transfer model curriculum for the high schools right now, but it's gonna be on the, the community college setting. Um, and so I, let me go ahead and share the screen and I'm, I've got a little PowerPoint. Um, let's see. All right. Here we go. Okay, so, there we are. Um, all right, so, okay, folks. Um, so I wanna talk about, in particular, uh, this idea of social justice studies. Um, and so let me go ahead and just kind of get moving and give a little bit of background. Um, 
And so um, I was hired in 2011 as the um, replacement for the one full-time instructor in Chicano Latino Studies at Fresno City College. Uh, CLS is part of the Cultural and Women's Studies Department, which is housed within social science, uh, the, the School of Social Science. Um, there were once a total of three full-time Chicano Latino Studies instructors on our campus, though uh, those positions were lost in the early, or in the 80s and 90s. Um, I say other stories for other times. When, when I was hired in 2011, uh, I came on board well aware that my predecessor, Arturo Amaro, uh, had been trying to rebuild the program in a, in a hostile environment. Um, and in particular, that the program had been approved for a campus-wide program review committee for a second full-time position. Um, and so um, it took me a little bit of while to figure this out, but I realized um, we had the kind of the campus-wide support but we were lacking it immediately um, from our dean, who was ultimately the decision maker on this sort of thing. Um, and I just say, I've kind of explained it in this way, saying being, being sort of naive at the time, I took my dean at her word, um, when she informed me that the reason she wasn't going to support a second full-time position was that we didn't have enough majors, in particular, in CLS. Uh, the fact that we collectively taught nearly a thousand students every semester with only one full-time faculty member, right, it wasn't, excuse me, wasn't as of as much importance. Um, and so I learned that, okay, this is what counts here is the majors, how many majors we have. That's what's gonna get us more faculty. Um, so my um, thinking at that point, I think along with my colleagues in cultural and women's studies was to do, uh, well, what we started was doing outreach to our counselors on campus to talk more to them about um, strategies, about why we didn't have more majors, what we could do about it. Um, and so, I say here begins the runaround. Not because of our counselors. Our counselors were great at, at helping us out with this, but, uh, but I, I'll give you the sense. So um, by, by 2012, 2013, we were, I was made aware at least of these new degrees, these associate degrees for transfer. Um, I say here I was a bit late to the conversation because that was really when I found out about Senate Bill 1440, um, which had created this whole new statewide framework for these degrees for transfer or ADTs um, in the name of student success, right? And so that was back in 2010. I probably didn't know about it until 2012. Um, by 2013, though, it was becoming clear that, uh, that those majors on our campus without these new degrees were not going to be getting much love or support from our administration. Um, we were informed that you know, students would even receive a 0.1 GPA boost at transfer just for being in these new degree programs, which made them that much more enticing in addition to the guarantee of being admitted as a junior um, to the CSU and you know, being yeah. So when uh, we, at that point, when we as a department, Cultural and Women's Studies, inquired um, up to the statewide folks about the possibilities of getting our own degrees, we were told that basically that those degrees were not meant for every program, that they were simply targeted at the most highly impacted and high demand majors statewide. Um, I do believe that it actually started with maybe the top 10 most high demand and then moved to the top 20 after that. But that was basically what we were told. Like, you know, that's the, you guys don't, don't have one. Um, this is just basically the website to get a, get a sense of it. And I, I, um, I'm not sure you know, how much folks know, I can, I guess, get to that in some of the questions here. But, um, but I want to jump ahead and move forward to um, 2013. Um, 2013, Senate Bill 440 um, amended 14 to increase flexibility um, within the newly created system and to draw attention to area of emphasis transfer degrees rather than being discipline specific like the ADT in psychology or the ADT in sociology. These were meant to create options um, for students to get degrees in, in broader fields um, as, as the legislation itself st states like broader fields like arts and humanities or social and behavioral sciences, that sort of a thing. Um, these are just a couple of direct quotes from the, from the legislation itself from SB 440, right? So before 2015-16, there shall be the development of at least two TMCs in areas of emphasis. Um, and I think, you know, we in ethnic studies or social justice studies were one of the first in terms of these area of emphasis uh, degrees for transfer. Um, and basically the SB 440 also mandated community colleges to create an associate degree for transfer in every major and area of emphasis offered by the college for any transfer model curriculum. So basically, I, my understanding of that was that if a transfer model curriculum was created that related to your discipline, you at your individual school have to be on top of it and create a new degree and, and get with it, basically. So um, that's a little bit of that background. 
So jumping ahead, 2014. Um, October of 2014, uh, myself and my office mate, um, uh, academic senate president currently at, at Fresno City College, uh, African American Studies instructor, Professor Carla Kirk, uh, and I decided to make the journey from the valley up to the Anza College to be part of the, uh, the Northern California Discipline Input Group for a, at that point, yet to be created area of emphasis, ADT, relevant to ethnic studies. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background, and so I, what I recall is lots of good conversation about the lack of support for our programs and departments, a lot of the same stuff we all talk about when we tend to get it together, um, uh, but very little in terms of seeing eye to eye about how we should all move forward. Um, we, in terms of the faculty in the room, repeatedly asked why, why we couldn't create individual ADTs in Asian American studies or uh, Chicano and Chicano studies, for example, and we're told that there weren't enough students majoring and transferring in those areas to justify creating degrees for everyone. Um, basically, this was gonna be the, the, this was the best we were going to get as far as being included. Um, and so again, it kind of came down to that issue of not enough majors. So, um, moving forward, uh, it was mostly, uh, from my recollection, ethnic studies and gender and women's studies professors, community college and CSU professors, instructors, um, and a lot of time was spent talking about naming the favorite of that day when we left, I think, was critical race and gender studies, although that was clearly not what was decided upon. Um, so at, after that, I think Carla, neither Carla or myself felt the need to really be more involved um, in, in that process or didn't feel like it was necessarily, I guess, uh, well, anyway, we didn't feel the need to be involved. And so we then heard about shortly thereafter the creation of this area of emphasis ADT called social justice studies. Um, and so once we heard about it, we started working on putting the degree together um, and created a general social justice studies degree where students could combine classes from any of our programs and cultural and women's studies um, and use that to transfer to the CSU. Um, and there at Fresno City, again, we have Chicano, Latin, Chicano Latino studies, African American, Asian American, American Indian studies, uh, American studies and women's studies as part of our department. Okay, so what, what is this? So putting aside the question of the, the name itself and getting into social justice, um, I'll just focus for a minute on the, what the major. So the core of the major at any community college that is offering it um, are intro to ethnic studies on one hand and intro to women's or gender studies on the other. Um, and then the rest of the major can um, be built upon that foundation. Um, those other classes, though, can be from a very broad range of disciplines and topics, including ethnic studies, clearly, and, and gender studies, but also peace and conflict studies, labor studies, gender and sexuality, uh, trans-border courses related to language, literature, and culture, more broadly, again. Um, so one thing I just wanted to point out there is that um, that kind of quickly and radically changed what a degree would look like in, in Chicano Latino studies at our institution. Um, and, uh, so prior to 2015, a degree would require well, other than your other general ed, obviously, but the, the core of the degree would only be Chicano and Latino studies courses. So this new ADT makes it so that the core of our degree are courses in what's now called American studies, our intro to ethnic studies course, and, um, and in women's studies. And so they're just, they're outside of our, our purview, essentially. Again, we're still related um, as, as colleagues. But um, let's see, so... Um, there was something else I wanted to say about the, the discipline piece, but I'll maybe come back to it. So, um, so moving forward, um, basically, I just want to introduce a, a name and, and again, speaking to what um, Guadalupe shared a minute ago, kind of giving thanks to those predecessors and recognizing we wouldn't be here without them, right? Um, is, uh, so Venancio Gaona is uh, a legendary figure of sorts, I would say, in the Latino community in Fresno. He's known and respected for his tireless activism, um, in particular in education. He was uh, once a Spanish instructor at FCC, before going on to be EOP director and the original founding faculty, actually, of our what was called Raza Studies. Um, he's been retired for some years and really is a full-time activist. So as the sole full-time instructor in, in CLS, I would expect and do expect to get an email or call from him at least once a semester, either asking me about how he could support us or informing me of something in the community of importance or something he wanted me to, to attend, you know, something along those lines. So uh, basically, Venancio got angry when he heard that this was the only option for a student who wanted to pursue Chicano studies was to get this social justice degree in particular because his take was that it was so general and, and watered down basically 
And so um, we're going to jump ahead here in the years. Uh, August 2018, I found myself <laughs> in a meeting with assembly member Arambula uh, from the valley here and uh, Venancio, arranged by him, of course, to discuss the lack of a clear option or an individual option for students wanting to major specifically in Chicano studies. Um, by September 2018, um, I got this email basically telling me um, you know, assembly member Ed Medina had supported this addendum and we would soon be able to offer essentially a specific degrees under the broader social justice studies heading. So at, at Fresno City, at least, to get to the, to the end here, um, uh, we have two social justice studies degrees right now and we're looking to create more in our other individual programs as well. But the general degree is one where, again, students have that intro to ethnic studies, intro to women's studies core, and then can, can explore basically very widely through our other disciplines. Um, and then we have one that's specific to Chicana, Chicano studies, um, and which is again, still requiring that same uh, core. So that's a basic kind of situation as far as just the, the what social justice studies is and why, why ethnic studies or any of us are called social justice studies now. I mean, at least at the community college level, that's the statewide term for us that we were all fitting underneath. So. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, I think obviously social justice is not a bad thing, um, right? It's, it's clearly, I think, a, a core component of Chicano and Chicano studies and ethnic studies more broadly, along with other core ideas of anti-racism, student-centered pedagogy, and anti-colonialism and anti-patriarchy, I think, are all these core components. But I do think it's, it's broad and diluted enough to include and be just about anything. Um, that's, that's pretty obvious also when you just kind of Google search social justice studies and what you see pop up, at least what I saw pop up first were programs at Los Rios Community College and Clovis Community College, neither, which, neither of which um, have ethnic studies programs. Like they've created these social justice studies programs um, basically using sociology and history classes and maybe some literature classes from English. But this was kind of the, I don't know, niche created for us who, who had gotten left behind in ethnic studies. And then now what I see at least is like the schools that are really running with this aren't, aren't even creating ethnic studies. They're just creating social justice studies. And, uh, and so anyway, that's, that's kind of where, where we're at. Um, I would say just bringing it back home, at least in terms of Fresno City College, um, our current college president, uh, Dr. Goldsmith, from the time she was hired in 2016, has been very enthusiastic about this new degree um, and has made this clear campus-wide speeches and really hyped up this idea of a social justice studies degree. But um, I mean, in the, in the time, in the intervening time, we haven't really seen any actual changes or support for our programs, I don't think, in any meaningful way. Um, over the past two years, I would say the focus um, on the new major has kind of shifted to a focus on the idea of a social justice center, um, which was proposed by, proposed over here by an English faculty member who, I, I mean, I say this kind of flippant but discovered the idea of social justice while on sabbatical back in 2015. Um, and so as things currently stand, this is my ending point here. Um, what, so our, our department, Culture Women's Studies, had a 10-year-old idea that's in the framework and in the action plan somewhere there for a student center for students of color. Um, uh, the equity committee had a similar idea and in that, you know, um, and so there, there are those two ideas, I think, for a, a, a center for students of color in particular and those have kind of been merged now with this english instructors ideas about a social justice center for you know for activism i mean but but in i i guess i share that because for me at least part of the part of the difficulty with this this new moniker is the fact that we're well no we're ethnic studies i think we you know we need to be a little bit more clear about about um the terms we're using and and for me at least that's even you know hoping that we can shift from being called cultural and women's studies to ethnic, ethnic and women's studies or something along those lines. But, um, but so that's, that's where I'm ending now. I hope to get into some discussion here and, and see what, you know, what pieces might be of interest to the rest of you and um, look forward to more conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, thank you to our presenters. Um, I've asked folks to type up their questions and concerns on um, the uh, chat page and I'm well I'm not going to we we are a little ahead of time thank you presenters but I'm gonna answer just a few of the questions we're trying to answer them um, as we go on but many of the questions that you have raised 
um, are actually topics of future um, discussions. Um, but I will share just a few that uh, I think that um, are worth sharing at this point, not that all, all of them are not worth sharing. The only one that we really haven't answered and that I'm hoping to um, move to uh, Guadalupe is I'm gonna read you the following question and then I'm gonna ask for your response to it. Okay. And then I will uh, respond to a few of the other questions that have come up. So the question is, will this be eventually trickled down to a middle school and elementary school? As an elementary school teacher, we feel that we can use ethnic studies in our classroom, especially here in California. And there were two questions uh, similar to that. What would be your opinion on that? Yeah, Lisa? absolutely. It should be, um, I mean, I would even say a pre-K curriculum, like daycare curriculum, <laughs> like the, our students need access to ethnic studies, you know, from, from birth. So yeah, I would say that we should, um, you know, progress to that movement. I definitely think once we, um, you know, figure out the, um, the issues around like the teacher credentialing and, and all of those things that we should really start considering, um, you know, even a middle school requirement. And I would definitely say um, teachers should be um, providing ethnic studies um, in elementaries as well, absolutely. I know I would want that for my children. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a mom of, uh, you know, a middle school age son, and I'm a mom of a elementary daughter, and I'm also a mom of a of a college student who goes to ASU, and I want I want them to have access to that, um, you know, for their lives, their educational lives. Um, Cindy, can I also ask you to respond to that question, and then yeah. we'll move into others? No, I think I would echo Guadalupe's comments regarding. I don't think it would be. I would not want for my daughter, who's three years old at this point, to first learn about her history in high school or college. You know, I want her to be able to have that experience early on because I know how transformative that, that experience is to see yourself in the history you're learning and learning about the contributions you, your, you know, your people have done for this country and for your community and understanding the structural barriers in place. So I do believe that, you know, in, Superintendent Thurman has been very clear about this understanding it's the importance of seeing role models and leadership and how you contribute. So I think early on uh, would be a wise choice around introducing ethnic studies. Thank you. And um, that is something that ethnic studies departments are also looking at. Um, at this point, we're allowed to develop single subject majors, um, but developing blended studies majors for students in ethnic studies has been a big challenge. Um, for many of us, so we're going to, that's one of the things that we're hoping to get out of this, of this series. Miguel raised, and I, um, Miguel and um, uh, Amber, I'm gonna try to respond to yours um, in, in the following way to your questions. Um, Amber raised how um, on, at the uh, Fullerton campus, the discussion about um, social justice uh, requirements or social justice um, credentials, or majors are not allowed to be under ethnic studies. They're actually, the move there is, um, the way she put it was, let me um, actually read uh, her. I'm the chair of ethnic studies at Fullerton College. We were told by a curriculum committee that any social justice um, degree with an emphasis could not be housed in ethnic studies, that it would be housed under the social science division since it is dis interdisciplinary. Well, first of all, Amber, obviously the folks on your campus do not know um, that ethnic studies is interdisciplinary by nature and they should probably go and um, read the Chancellor's Ethnic Studies Task Force before um, they uh, speak further on this. And um, uh, uh, Miguel raised a question about how, um, and, and now we get part of your question is the very reason why we wanted to host uh, the seminar uh, or the series of seminars, originally a conference, and that was the question about whether or not we want to consider a need for an ethnic studies teaching credential. Um, the current definition of having English or history um, at the high school is quite problematic. Um, I think that that's, that's part of the conversation we want to have and why we have so many people in this seminar, including uh, members of um, the, the teachers union who um, 
is, has been originally opposed to the proliferation of credential, but perhaps we want them uh, to uh, consider this option. We also know that you're, you need a strong undergraduate degree. You can't just have a fifth year program and think you're gonna learn everything there is to know in ethnic studies in a credential option without having a strong major in Chicano studies or Africana studies, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we wanna, we wanna lead, all of this discussion leads to a final forum where all of us are in the room to discuss what are the next steps we see forward. Fire to go to the CTC challenge and some of the things that they um, know. Um, other questions that are being raised, um, I will, uh, will either, uh, and others have raised, and this is again why we're moving into the next panel so I hope my next set of panelists are here I'm going to ask Patricia to check that the the question that Matt raised about um, the the umbrella of social justice or the umbrella of diversity or the umbrella of um, oh I don't know um, of multiculturalism um, has often been used as a way to dilute the influence of ethnic studies and whether it's intent, the intention or not, um, it does impact whether or not students major in ethnic studies or whether or not ethnic studies faculty have the voice in developing those. So the issue of social justice can be difficult, not only Jenny to create programs um, and create a, a transfer program, but it also um, makes it problematic when you begin to look at issues of um, who, is, who are in those programs and where are the ethnic studies faculty. So again, that's something that we want to continue to enter, entertain and have some discussion on in the future. Um, and then others uh, we will get into. Um, uh, Marcos, what we want to do is get into the working definition of ethnic studies. Again, that's going to be the future of some um, discussion. And hopefully, um, we can include your work and others' work in helping to determine that as a starting point. Uh, so, uh, Patricia, are you on? We have so many great here. We actually have about 30 minutes left. So okay. we can still uh, take some more questions or if the panelists want to add anything based on some of the other questions popping up. Can the panelists see all the questions? If you hit the Q&A at the bottom, you should be able to get a little screen that comes up. Emily, there already are some um, um, ethnic studies single subject degrees that lead into uh, subject matter preparation programs. Um, each campus does, each um, ethnic studies major is able to do that. We will be sharing some of those examples um, later in this session. You want to answer Kelly's question, Lupe, or Cindy? Kelly's question is, what are we going to do about the model curriculum? Is there a path forward that includes the ethnic studies mandate of transforming conditions in our society? I think, um, yeah, that would probably be better um, answered by, by Cindy. Hi, Kelly, this is Cindy. Thanks for your question. So you know, like I said earlier in my comments is that we essentially at the Department of Education would have the public comment period still is in process. So regarding the concerns about activism and making sure we're transforming the conditions and that stays intact within ethnic studies, that would be something that's still decided through the International Quality Commission and making sure that that, that input is received. So there's still time to make sure that that's loud and clear to the members when they do decide, when they're able to meet again in the summer. Um, to take that vote and have that conversation around the model curriculum, that that's still intact. So that would be my, my best suggestion is to continue to advocate through the ethnic studies um, at cde.ca.gov, send your comments there. Um, 
they, that way they can be captured. Glenn, um, Glenn is asking about um, what other ways can we implement ethnic studies? We'll be um, sharing several examples um, in other sessions. We hope you can join us. We, we'll also be um, uh, we'll also be uh, taping them or recording them. Uh, ben and Kyle, we actually will be answering that question as well throughout the series. Um, will be uh, uh, Guillermo Gomez from your district actually is one of our presenters. Plus we have members from other district collaboratives who will be presenting how uh, they're moving towards the requirement in their districts. Um, Trisha, thanks. I hope you can share with us some of the work that um, you are doing. Well, I know me, uh, Trisha is the co-chair of the Ethnic Studies Advisory Committee at San Diego, and they're working on developing courses. Mm -hmm. um, one of their concerns, I agree. And I think one of the concerns is we have a solid shared definition of ethnic studies. Uh, we agree, and that's one of the things that we want to move towards in this yeah. Um, in this series of webinars is to collectively come together with a joint definition of what we mean. Uh, we think that there was a pretty solid one within the Chancellor's Task Force and in the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Draft, but we would love to involve more voices in, in trying to consider uh, what that is and what it isn't. And Matt's question about social justice and diversity and multicultural um, education kind of makes that even a little bit more difficult thing to reach. So I can respond a little bit to um, Glenn Singley's question. Um, it says, after developing ES at our site in Sacramento, we started building out to our feeder middle school. We've also developed specific lit courses. We're lucky because our admin doesn't pay attention to us and the admin at the middle school is all in. So in what ways can we better implement ethnic studies concepts in other disciplines? Um, I know that um, there are districts that have already created uh, courses that are that have been even approved, like UCOP approved, in um, you know in in theater, in Spanish, uh, even in math, that are um, ethnic studies that use the ethnic studies guiding principles and values. And I think that that's something that we all, you know, the you know 160 folks that are on here need to start thinking about implementing further. Um, I know that us as um, the Association of Raza Educators, when we have our, um, our annual institutes and then also with our membership, we've also um, tried to really push forward, um, you know, some of our members that are experts like in um, biology or in other, other fields besides just, you know, social studies and literature to create lesson plans and course outlines. And so I think that's something that, that we are going to have to do, not just on, um, you know, relying on like the state to, to um, facilitate that, but also for us ourselves to, to be a part of, um, of creating that curriculum. And then most importantly, ensuring that it's available um, to everybody, you know, that it's, uh, it's widely accessible and free uh, curriculum, model curriculum that is available to everybody. Right. Um, there was one here that was for you, Matt. I am going to, Melissa's. Um, has the concern that the CCC, the community college campuses, not creating an ethnic studies degree ra been raised to the chancellor's office? Uh, no, it hasn't. I mean, not as, not as far as I know of. And I think that's a great idea. I saw that and was like, oh, that's a great idea, Melissa. That's, um, that's a good place to, to go. Now we have a coalition that will go with you. There we go. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. I, I actually, I saw above that too, Jenny Luna had a comment and question about Can't hear you. Matt, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sorry about that. Um, so I, I wanted to share Jenny Luna's question that was above Melissa's there. And at, uh, so she says, the problem with social justice is that it isn't an academic discipline, therefore difficult to transfer. Mm -hmm. I don't know any four-year universities that have a degree in it. And so how are we working to translate these courses to the four-year, the CSU? Um, she says in, in her county, we have an AA in Chicano Chicano Studies and the ADT in social justice. How can we best communicate that an AA in Chicano Chicano Studies will still give them an opportunity to get into a four-year? Um, and, and so, I mean, to me, it's, it's 
that's been the, the connect with counseling. I mean, it's really counselors are the first line in terms of they're the ones who are working with students more, at least at our school, in terms of majors and that sort of thing, right? Um, and so I feel like that's been a really difficult thing that, that they've been telling me for the last many years that like, no, we're being told we should push students into these ADT programs. That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing, basically. Like, and so that, that's a difficult, that's, that's a, diff it's a good question. And, and uh, in terms of, I don't, I don't know how to best address it. Um, uh, that, but, go ahead. That, I was gonna say that may be a, um, a question that we want to pose for our final forum and that we actually really spent some time discussing that because it is a, if we're talking about a, a smooth, a seamless pathway, it's going to be a question that we do, we need to address. So we have a questionnaire at the end of this that we're going to be asking you for um, your feedback on and additional things that you might um, want to make sure that we address, including things like I, a lot of people are typing in uh, programs or projects that they're working on. And like I said earlier, there's a lot we haven't covered. Um, also make sure that you um, put that in the evaluation so that we can include others um, other in other topics. One, um, one thing I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> oh, sorry, I just, one thing that Jenny's question I, I, um, brought up to me that I wanted to kind of throw in there, um, it was, uh, I'm not lost my train of thought, but I knew that. Um, that um, I'm looking at it again here. I lost. Yeah. Um, oh, it's in the answered questions now in the ah, question. That's, that's why. What, that's why it took me a while to get back to it there too. So, um, oh, so one of the things, that's what it was, was, was what was brought up in conversation with Patricia some months ago was um, this idea about whether or not individual like Chicana and Chicano studies departments at CSU Channel Islands, for instance, whether or not those CSU faculty can decide to accept or not accept a student transferring into their program with an ADT in social justice studies. And so my sense of what I learned from that was that, um, that the individual departments aren't deciding that, that that's not their decision, that those are behind the scenes right. decisions that are being made. That so, so even if the Chicana Chicano Studies Department at Channel Islands, for instance, where I believe Jenny still is, uh, it wants to, doesn't want that ADT in social justice studies. They only want the AA in the actual discipline. They can't do that. As far as I know, I mean, that's, that's my sense of it, is that, you know, it's, it's a statewide agreement, there's laws on it, and, and they have to, they have to accept those students. So I just wanted to throw that, that piece in, in terms of at least the autonomy, or who's making decisions about, um, again, whether that social justice de degree is accepted. Um, Jen, uh, I'm gonna, go, I'm going down to um, some of the other questions. Jen, um, Stacy, on the issue of liberal studies and ethnic studies, I think that's a, a bigger uh, question um, that we will be looking at in um, in the future. Um, uh, just offhand, um, some of the discussion that some of us have had as it relates to ethnic studies is that. Um, it for an uh, for an undergraduate major, um, a liberal studies major, uh, that there's a contradiction in in developing these um, liberal studies majors with an emphasis in ethnic studies. Um, we at one time did have a requirement where sometimes you had to have nine units in that, and now it means you know it, it depends on. One, the collaboration between ethnic studies and liberal studies, which to date on some campuses has been troubling. Um, and then the other is the number of units students are taking uh, and the courses uh, that are required. So in some cases, uh, you have stronger um, ethnic studies programs that have already developed pedagogical coursework that you don't need to have a liberal studies major, you just need to have an ethnic studies major with the um, emphasis in elementary ed. So that's a broader question that we could probably um, put on the agenda for later. And the other questions, oh my goodness, there's so many and I'm like picking and choosing here. So maybe, um, we could have, uh, there's one for Cindy, so I'm just gonna pose this, I'm skipping all over the place so folks can be skipping with me. 
there's one for you, Cindy, on um, a statewide graduation requirement as a high school admi administrator. It's been uh, simply a su supply and demand with credentials. I believe Assemblymember Medina was carrying that bill. Um, I have not tracked it as of this point, but last I had heard a few months ago it was paused. Right. I don't know the details on that. But um, I, do, I do think they're waiting for the, that's what I said earlier, they're waiting for the IQC because the IQC's determination in many people's eyes will determine whether or not this goes forward. Yes, and you know, like I mentioned in my opening comments that the timeline around the IQC, if we're hoping for uh, a date in sometime late summer to reconvene the conversation around the model curriculum. And in that meantime, folks can continue to advocate for their areas of interest in making sure components are still intact in the curriculum by emailing our ethnic studies mailbox. Um, and that way that process will continue. So that way there's other um, decisions that can be made regarding that graduation requirement. I think the other thing uh, in response to um, there are so many other questions that I think we're gonna um, will move um, into the next session. Can I just uh, make like one uh, final comment? Absolutely, Lupe. Help okay, so, talk so much. Sorry, I just wanted to remind folks that um, there's also the Save California Ethnic Studies Coalition that was formed from this. And if you Google Defend Ethnic Studies or Save California Ethnic Studies, the petition will come up. And if you haven't signed it yet, we'd appreciate oh. you sign it. Um, just as the California Department of Education through those well-funded lobbies received um, a whole bunch of the same kind of critique of the draft of the curriculum, we want to also show that um, there are a lot of folks that are in support. So if you and your organization can do that, that would be that would be wonderful. It's um so the Save California Ethnic Studies sorry Save California Ethnic Studies Coalition. There's a website and any um any uh, comments that you send to the California Department of Education email would be great if you could also send that to uh, Save California Ethnic Studies and also um, if you could please sign the petition. It's a change.org petition. Save California Ethnic Studies or Defend Ethnic Studies. Uh, so uh, again, um, one more response to um, Jenny, and then there was a question down below. Um, also, I think it was uh, Ben. Um, there, Jenny raised a question about instead of a or in, um, as it relates to credential, perhaps a certificate program, and it would be great if the CSUs co collaborate on this. I think. Some of the, and again, this is part of the reason we're having this because we, we want to have a broader conversation with. Um, members of the CSU plus our district. Part of the discussion has been um, perhaps a credential program for those who are going into teaching and a certificate program for those who are already in teaching. So inside the classroom that would require similar to what we had when we had the CLAD program where you had to have a certain number of units in order to teach ethnic studies in a district. Um, voluntary, of course, and not to the extent that we had CLAD, but that a certificate program would be um, for folks like that. So there, there was that, there's that discussion. Again, it's something that we, in this um, uh, collaborative, can have a lot more discussion about. Mm -hmm. um, and then I am looking at all the other questions. I think uh, we can get to some of those later. Yeah, uh, there's there's one by uh, Gina Facaldo that is specific to like environmental um, justice and the earth. And so I just wanted to say that Stevie Ruiz is going to be in the second webinar that we'll be speaking to a lot of that, correct? Correct. That's his forte. We're going to yeah. talk about that. Um, and uh, Teresa, I think some of the others that are coming up, there's there are multiple questions about PD, supporting teachers, uh, pathways. Those are all things that we'll address in future upcoming webinars. So I think if um, we'll be sure to make sure to send out the schedule again, because I think those panels will address some of these other questions that are hanging on here. Okay. Okay, so then uh, can we move to the other panel? Let's do it. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so we are now, thank you for those tons. We can save the chat too to answer um, other questions. We're gonna move on to our, um, our next panel. And the next panel, 
um, kind of piggybacks um, off of uh, uh, Matt's uh, discussion or conversation. And that's the question about myths and the whitewashing of ethnic studies. We have, in, in this case, invited um, a number of folks who are actually faculty of um, several different disciplines within ethnic studies, community activists, and um, K-12 teachers. So I am going to um, introduce each of the panelists, um, and then you uh, will hear from them in uh, the order that I introduce them. The first one, um, my colleague um, and uh, fellow struggler in the struggle for ethnic studies in the CSU and elsewhere is uh, Dr. Melina Abdullah, who's a professor of uh, Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. She's the co-founder of Black Lives Matter um, Los Angeles chapter, and she's a leader in both the fight for ethnic studies in K-12 and the university. Um, and is a part of the historic victory to make ethnic studies requirement um, in Los Angeles. Um, the second presenter is Robin Rodriguez, uh, who is a professor of Asian American studies at the University of California, Davis. She's the founding director of the Bulusan Center for Filipino Studies, the only research center focused on Filipino Americans nationally and she's also served on the National uh, Association for Asian American Studies for two terms. Our third pre uh, presenter is uh, Emily Robertson, Assistant Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies uh, at Cal State um, LA. She's a co-director of METSIL Project's Ready to Rise uh, Youth Program. Um, and is uh, an active member in American Indian community and indigenous arts communities in Los Angeles and serves on the Artists Roundtable for Self-Help Graphics uh, and is a member of the American Indian Community Council. Tanya Jaco is an English and language arts and social studies teacher in San Jose Unified. Tanya is a, a member of the Board of Directors of the National Education Association a member of the California Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Review Committee for CTA, um, is a member of uh, the, um, I already said the uh, NEA, and also a leading member of the Black Caucus within CTA and NEA. Mary Levi um, is a, a colleague and uh, um, enrolled as a member of the Hopi Nation in uh, Northern Arizona. She has been an elementary school teacher in Upland for the last 29 years. She has uh, chaired both the uh, American Indian and Alaskan Native Caucus for uh, the California Teachers Association and the National Education Association. And she has uh, worked hard in promoting the accurate and uh, sensitive portrayal of American Indians in the curriculum. That has been her passion and uh, the main area of her work. And finally, uh, uh, Stevie Reese, who is a professor of Intersections Comparative Ethnic Studies at Cal State Northridge in Chicano Studies. Um, he's a member of the Liberated Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Coalition, a professor um, and scholar at CSU Northridge. His focus on the intersection of comparative ethnic studies, environmental law, and law and conflict um, in rural studies. All of these folks um, have been leaders in, um, in the struggle for ethnic studies. And so now I am going to be quiet and turn it over to um, Dr. Melina Abdullah. Melina's still joining, so we'll actually we'll start off with Dr. Ro uh, Rodriguez. Okay, so we're starting off with... Okay, I'll go ahead. Let me just screen share, yeah? Yeah, thank you, Robin. Yeah, sure. So today, uh, the topic that I'm going to address is, is specifically understanding the roots of Asian American and Arab American studies, since a lot of the debate really has kind of uh, centered on um, the status of, Asia, of Arab American studies, its connection to Asian American studies, specifically in ethnic studies more broadly. So the title of my uh, presentation is Third World Studies and Understanding the Roots of Asian American and Arab American studies. So one thing, I really have just a couple key points. The first, 
um, has to do with um, really taking us back to understanding, sorry, ethnic studies as third world studies. I think it's very, very important to locate the field um, that we now call ethnic studies to its origins in movements that coalesced around a third world identity and relatedly a third world analysis. I think that's very, very important because I think some of the confusion related to what does and does not constitute ethnic studies comes unfortunately from the term itself, oftentimes people not even understanding kind of where it comes from. But as Asian American studies scholar Gary Okihiro has argued, um, it wasn't necessarily ethnic studies that groups like the Third World Liberation Front were, were struggling for. Uh, they were struggling for and fighting against a Eurocentric and white supremacist system of higher education and knowledge production. Uh, that was really what the vision was. Now, ethnic studies as a term was already itself a kind of whitewashed term. It was rooted in research being done primarily by white scholars, mainly sociologists who were studying white ethnic group, um, white ethnic groups and their immigration and settlement uh, and assimilation into U.S. society. So in a lot of ways, ethnic studies as a term at the time was something that was sort of legible to those in power, responsible um, in, in, in having to meet the demands of protesters. So it, it was already kind of an imperfect term um, that was being circulated among white academics and ultimately, I think, really misapplied by describing the kind of knowledge production that was actually being thought fought for and, and really it, it, it might be better understood as third world studies. I think it's important to note um, again that, that folks who came together were coming together in the third world liberation front. They didn't therefore just identify as peoples of color with, a, with distinctive histories in the United States uh, but um, as racialized people but you know, and that was obviously part of it, but they were also understood themselves as connected to people who had been subject to white supremacist colonization and empire in the world. And I think this is really crucial, especially because there's all this, this debate about foundational groups. And I think the real issue is what was the foundational perspective, the analysis? I think that's absolutely crucial. That's what was being fought for. And I think that's what's at stake here when we talk about um, uh, what should constitute uh, kind of what we're calling ethnic studies today. Um, again, and this comes from, this quote comes from uh, a publication rep that, re that recently was published by folks in Asian American studies at Berkeley and LA and, and San Francisco State reflecting on our 50 years. Um, and, and I think this is really great because this really come, uh, I think, captures what was and is still at stake when we're thinking about um, so-called ethnic studies, that uh, the third world as a term recognized the exploitative relations in the global hierarchy where the least developed nations faced oppressive histories and conditions similarly to historically marginalized communities in, in the U.S. And I would actually argue that it's even more than just kind of uh, recognizing a similarity, but actually identif um, folks identified that um, who identified with uh, third world as a as a as a as identity as an uh, analysis recognize that the very similar dynamics of dispossession and landlessness genocide slavery um, and exploitation that organizes U.S. white settler colonial racial capitalism produce the conditions of the third world and this is really really need to be um, underscored I think um, you know that ethnic studies it's a term that we're using. Um, but it's fundamentally ethnic studies, as I understand, and I think that many of us understand it, is fundamentally about cultivating critical understandings of the various intersecting power structures that organize American society and really the world. And there's an especial focus on race, on the system of white supremacy, on anti-blackness. And this is far more than a multiculturalist or diversity. And, and I, I would, you know, add that social justice kind of perspective even. Um, but, you know, this approach to education that, that tends to be more celebratory. So diversity studies or multiculturalist approaches or diversity approaches tend to be very kind of celebratory, which is not a bad thing necessarily, right? Recognizing and affirming and valuing cultural differences among us, that's a good thing. But um, 
again, that's not necessarily uh, to be conflated with ethnic studies, which is really about analyzing, critiquing, unpacking, and in fact, challenging white supremacy and anti-blackness. And you know, just a point around kind of whether or not activism should be in the curriculum. It has to be. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is mo our education encourages civic engagement, but civic engagement is not, should not be delimited to just showing up at the ballot box. It does include organizing. It does include activism. And it does include kind of democracy of the streets. And I think that that should be continued to be part of our curriculum, whether it's kind of ethnic studies and even more broadly. Um, now, just, you know, laying that foundation of understanding um, that ethnic studies is really around, you know, and, uh, third world studies, I think then helps folks to maybe better understand what, why Asian American studies and Arab American studies are very much connected, that Arab American studies, Asian American studies is, is inclusive of Arab, Arab American studies, even though it also, um, you know, uh, kind of exists in its own right. And that's really my second major point here. Um, on a basic level, level Asia, Arab American history is very much intertwined with Asian and even Latinx immigration history. Immigrants of color in this country have histories that are very, very much entangled. Uh, Arab, Asian, and again, even Latinx early immigration, especially here in California, was a consequence of racialized labor demand in agriculture. Uh, though they were actually recruited um, in ways such as to create divisions among each other, um, which would just make Mean, uh, make for more profits for employers, immigrants of color uh, did come together across racial and ethnic lines in solidarity, and that's especially evidenced in the formation of the United Farm Workers. They united farm workers because they were united across racial and ethnic lines. lines. And, um, you know, oftentimes we don't know um, about kind of Filipinos' roles in kind of the UFW, and or even the roles of African Americans, and in this case, Yemeni um, immigrant workers like uh, Nagi Daifal, um, Daif, uh, Daifala. Um, just in terms of Asian American studies, I think just in most recent history, it's probably kind of in the post 9-11 period, especially around Homeland Security and the global war on terror, where it really, really becomes especially clear. Um, again, I, I think it had always been clear for us, but I think this is where um, uh, it became a, a kind of uh, uh, important moment, at least in, in, uh, in recent history of uh, of, uh, of a, a you know greater coming together, but um, you know it was in the Department of Homeland Security in response to um, the 9/11 attacks and instituted the special education uh, special registration program that surveilled and unlawfully de detained Arabs and Muslims who were being deemed as security threats in the months after 9/11, and many uh, of course were reminded of of um, of how that connected and was very similar to the logics of the internment of Japanese Americans during during World War II. Of course, the truth of the matter is, you know, the special registration program by attacking Arabs and Muslims, many, many in the Asian American community or people that we conventionally think of as Asian are also Muslim. Filipinos are Muslim. Indonesians are also Muslim. Um, uh, so that's also uh, an important point to be made. Um, of course, we're seeing uh, increasingly more and more uh, anti-Asian hate crimes and harassment due to uh, the rise in xenophobia uh, fueled by the coronavirus pandemic. And again, you know, in these moments, you're seeing Asian, Arabs and Muslims also uh, connecting these, uh, their experiences uh, in the post 9 11 period now to uh, the kinds of um, uh, animus that, that is being directed towards, uh, towards uh, various uh, Asian groups. Uh, just as a field of study, I think it's important that the Association for Asian American Studies, which represents our field, um, has been very, very clear, came out very, very explicitly, especially in response to some of the, the pushback against the model curriculum, that Arab American studies has been a part of the broader field of Asian American studies for nearly two decades and ethnic studies since its inception uh, 50 years ago. And so that's, that was very, very clearly articulated um, uh, by, by the association and something very much shared um, across uh, among Asian American studies scholars. Um, our own department um, uh, is, we, we have a scholar who's been very much invested in and interested in Arab American studies. Um, she helped to organize what's called the West Asia section, which is inclusive of um, 
areas where Arabs have uh, what, we, what we think of uh, as kind of uh, the countries of origin for, for Arab Americans. So I think that's really a, a, another important uh, point to be made. And my, my final point really, right, I just wanted to kind of lay the groundwork for where do we really under, how can we really understand ethnic studies and as third world studies, where are the connections between Asian Americans and Arab Americans? And finally, what does this all mean for our fight? And, and um, what are the next steps in the fight for ethnic studies? Um, clearly, there's been a lot of focus on the ethnic studies model curriculum, and I think we continue to need to fight for that, to insist on this understanding of ethnic studies and not have it be whitewashed. Um, I think also uh, we need to kind of really continue to grow a much more comprehensive movement. I think it's already come up in the earlier webinar. We need to talk about credentialing. How is credentialing happening on this uh, in this state? Um, you know, to what extent is ethnic studies just in terms of content and pedagogical approaches part of teacher credentialing and how do we fight for that? Um, how do we continue to fight at the state level and yet also fight at the local level at, at you know, multiple at, in school districts? Um, and we also actually have to fight for ethnic studies at the UC system. We cannot, um, as you know, I think a lot of uh, ethnic studies kind of as a whole, all the way from the K through 12, through the community colleges, to, through the CSUs, we need to ensure that, that, that ethnic studies is vibrant in the UCs because without the scholarship, the research, we don't have people who are continuing to center our voices, write our stories, write our research, write our experiences, centering them. Um, and, and this is where I'm hoping that my, my colleagues at the UCs will really follow your lead. Folks in the community colleges and the CSUs and in and, and the K through 12, you've been at the helm of this movement and we have not been there in the same ways. And I'm hoping that that changes because we need to fight for ethnic studies um, and, and we need to kind of join in coalition across systems because the truth of the matter is, you know, every dilemma, you know, that I hear that it, how people are struggling at the C, uh, in the community college system and the CSUs, we're fighting the same fight, um, fighting for our very existence, um, you know, fighting for the dollars, for the hires, uh, and, and, you know, and we continue to be very, very marginalized in the UCs. We, we barely have opportunities to be able to kind of do our research. I mean, even the very creation of the Belusan Center for Philippine Studies, that's not coming from the UCs. We had to go to the legislature and fight for that uh, because there's clearly a lack of, um, uh, of support for the kind of work uh, that those of us who do this work uh, do at the UC system. So I think that's that's really crucial. A final point is I think in order for us to grow this movement, we actually have to do ethnic studies outside of the classroom. We have to show the value of ethnic studies uh, through other forms of education to build this movement because the truth is a lot of people do not know what it's about. And I think it's really, um, we, we have to take it into multiple spaces um, to be able to kind of show the value so we can and do that kind of political education if you will, so that we can grow this movement. And of course, obviously, we cannot grow this movement if we're not also working um, and, and, and in, in connection with other anti-racist, racist, abolitionist, indigenous, and worker struggles. I mean, this is all very, very much connected. Uh, and, and I think my 15 minutes are over. I'll end there. Thank you. Melina is uh, still trying to uh, log in. So um, then uh, we will go to Kimberly Robertson yeah. from Cal State LA. Kimberly? Yes. Thank you. Peace, Jay. Um, Kimberly Robertson, Chaho Chifkados, Uma Dawados, um, Kawita, Loman Uma Dawados, Big Springs. So my name's Kimberly Robertson. Um, thank you for having me. I'm a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, and um, I, I just introduced myself with my, in my language in my tribal towns. Um, I want to acknowledge first that I am um, currently a professor at Cal State LA, and so I'm working on unceded Tongva territory. I live and work on unceded Tongva territory, but I'm also a former professor um, at Cal State Northridge, and so I work very closely with the Tataviam peoples as well. So... I come to the conversation today as, um, I, I mean, I come to the conversation today as a native feminist, right? And um, for me, my, my um, understanding of ethnic studies, my orientation to it comes particularly through that lens. And so, you know, I think that when we start, I, I wanted to just talk a little bit today about how we can think of ethnic studies in terms of the relationship to indigeneity. And I know a lot of that work is already being done, but also in relation to feminism um, and work for, for you know, queer 
queer justice, um, women's justice, two-spirited justice, et cetera. And so, so, you know, I wanted to start by saying, um, right, that as a Native feminist, so, so my current position at Cal State Los Angeles is a position in women's, sex, women's gender and sexuality studies. And my degrees are in, I have a master's degree in American Indian studies from, from, from UCLA. And then I have a, a PhD in women's studies. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit for me, part of this conversation. Um, and I think one of the, one of the interventions that a critical indigenous studies can bring to our discussions around ethnic studies is really sort of um, a, a more serious interrogation of the discipline of the way that the, the academy has um, has in particular attempted to um, organize the disciplines, right? And to really like one of the primary ways that we have, um, I really appreciated your thoughts, Robin, around, around the way that ethnic studies has been, um, has been in many ways constructed to be legible to the settler state, right? To the white supremacist nation state. And for many of us, we actually don't, particularly for indigenous scholars, we don't find ourselves located within ethnic studies programs even, because those programs have also, um, those programs have also operated sort of in the way ways that they have been, the ways they have been co-opted, they have operated, right, to invisibilize American Indian peoples. So at many of our campuses, I know all, you know, we're, we're coming from our variety of spaces, but still at many of the UCs, many of the Cal States, many of the community colleges, we don't even have American Indian Studies programs. And so I just mentioned a little bit my trajectory, right, to say um, my PhD is in gender studies because at UCLA there isn't a PhD in American Indian Studies. I teach in the Department of Women and Gen Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Cal State LA, um, both because I'm, I'm very, again, I'm a native feminist, I'm very invested in the ways in which settler colonialism and cis heteropatriarchy intersect with one another. However, there also is, there is no American Indian Studies program at Cal State LA. Um, you know, and these are campuses that have 50 years, right? This is a campus with a 50 year old history of very vibrant ethnic studies programs on it. Um, yet American Indian studies has still been completely invisibilized, completely erased. Um, on that campus, right, I am the only American Indian studies scholar. There are a few other American Indian identified faculty and staff. Yet none of them also come through the American Indian Studies pipeline, um, and that may be in part for their own reasons, but it, may, it also, right, is because we still have such a lack of representation of these programs, the existence of these. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how, for me then, in our sort of dreaming of ethnic studies and really operationalizing a critical ethnic studies that is really going to attend, again, to, to sort of link back to Robin, that's really going to attend to that matrix of domination, right? That includes settler colonialism as much as it does anti-Blackness and anti-immigrant and, um, uh, you know, these various um, hierarchy, or excuse me, these various tools of domination, it's going to require us, I think, to think a little bit outside of this, this disciplining of ethnic studies, that ethnic studies only occurs in particular disciplines and particular departments, right? I mean, that very, if we work from an indigenous framework, um, you know, so from an indigenous studies framework, if we think about like decolonizing the academy or decolonizing the institution, right, then we recognize that the entire, again, as has already been mentioned, but the entire construction of the ethnic studies disciplines into these very siloed and these uh, quote unquote four foundational groups very much works in the sort of, um, in the service of empire, in the service of white supremacy, imperialism, et cetera. It really restricts how we can know in the world um, and it makes our knowledges both, you know, how we, how we understand the world and then how we express them. It really, again, makes them legible to a particular project and agenda, which I, I would argue, right, neoliberalism, capitalism, settler colonialism, et cetera. Um, you know, and so I think for myself, one of the things that becomes really disappointing in these conversations is that there is frequently, there frequently seems to be, um, 
you know, they're just frequently, right, we talk about these tensions between whether or not gender and women's studies can be part of an ethnic studies conversation. And we talk about um, the quote unquote, right, white women's studies and how, how if we allow women's and gender and sexuality studies into ethnic studies, dialogues, coalitions, and spaces that we, I think this is one of the myths of whitewashing, right, is that then we are opening up ethnic studies to be whitewashed. And although I certainly, um, you know, as again, as an indigenous feminist that has, has moved through a variety of academic spaces, I'm a first generation college student. Um, you know, I've been, I have three masters. I, I've been in, I've been in um, academia forever, right? Because I never had a clear path through. I didn't understand what I was doing. And I've been in a variety of institutions. And while I can certainly say that absolutely there is a mainstream white stream feminist movement, a mainstream white stream feminist studies, but there are just as vibrant and just as radical, I mean, just as significant and dominant um, women of color, women of color, queer of color, trans of color led um, gender, sexuality, and women's studies programs. And I think that we really lose something when we refuse to see um, when we refuse to see the way in which we can engage with allies and we can engage and, and, and that we find, in fact, not even just allies, but our own relatives, we find us positioned in a variety of different disciplines for a variety of different reasons. Um, and I think the exclusion of these programs that we believe are quote unquote, you know, white programs can be very, very, um, have really dire consequences, both for our students and the future generations, but also I think it's extremely, for me, it's an extremely violent process to do to the, the generations and generations of feminists of color that come before me, right? And that have done the work to really make sure that women's gender and sexuality studies is not um, that that is not a project of the settler state or of the white supremacist state, and that it is also a project that we need to bring, um, you know, that we need to have within our communities of color and within our marginalized communities as well. Um, so I think, you know, I primarily, you know, what I, I just wanted to speak a little bit about as well, for me, is that, again, this works hand in hand with coming from an indigenous or a American Indian studies perspective, right, is that um, for indigenous folks, we, I cannot tear apart that relationship between cis heteropatriarchy and settler colonialism. Prior to colonization, we did not have the same understandings of gender and sex, the same very violent hierarchical, um, you know, understandings of, uh, we had understandings of kinship and relatives that were much more expansive. So for me, it's not even possible to, to engage in an American Indian studies sort of project or a or critical indigenous studies um, or a, an, an ethnic studies project without always having at the core the relationship to cis heteropatriarchy as well. Um, yeah, and so those were sort of um, the primary points that I wanted to bring up. Um, I, do, I do really appreciate also Robin's comments at the end there about the insignificance of doing ethnic studies outside of the classroom. I think again, to remember for, for American Indian communities, we still have the lowest educational attainment rates. We have, um, you know, very few of our students are on college campuses. Um, and when they are, again, they're invisibilized at every turn, right? So um, I think that uh, I, I've also been, um, I'm also have worked very much in the American Indian, I was a chairperson for LAUSD's American Indian Education Program. And there, this is a similar program, I mean, this is a similar issue that we saw there, was that if we are solely going to talk about, if we are solely going to talk about um, ethnic studies in sort of these foundational, these, core, these ways that we're speaking, these four foundational core groups, rather than, again, like Robin said, these foundational perspectives and analyses that American Indians always get left out of the conversation, right? Because statistic, quote unquote, statistically, we're just not significant enough. And so, you know, the same problem happens in LAUSD as it, it, it filters all the way up and down through the educational pipeline. And so I do, I, 
I would also encourage us to really, you know, make sure that we are taking these ethnic studies outside of the classrooms. Um, my American Indian studies at the university in some, I mean, for me, right, it's, it's almost futile if that work is not going on in community as well. Because for the most part, the students that I'm reaching at Cal State LA don't identify as American Indian, but they still need to understand their relationship, right, to empire, settler colonialism, et cetera. So I think I'll end there, um, but thank you for your time. I'm really happy, I'm, I'm really so blessed to be on online with everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. We're blessed to have your perspective. Um, and our next uh, speaker finally was able to get on. We're so glad she was. Um, my sister, um, Melina Abdullah, are you on? Tell me she is. I am on. Let me turn on my video. So all of us are in the space of trying to figure out how to do multiple things at a time. And I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, hey, Stevie. we can hear you. Okay, I'm turning my video on and hoping I, um, it's not obvious that I'm trying to run around and parent three kids at home while I'm also trying to um, engage in this really, really important work. And I think this is another way that um, disaster capitalism attacks us, right? Is, um, you know, it, it moves when it thinks we can't. And so we just can't afford to, um, we got to figure it out. We got to figure it out. And so anyway, I'm really, really happy to be with you. Um, Teresa and I and Stevie and lots of other folks have been doing work around ethnic studies in the CSU for a very long time. Um, and also in LAUSD, so the requirement in LAUSD actually came from students organizing um, out of Cal State LA. So I'll give a little bit of that history. Um, I also do want to engage in um, a space of tension. Um, I very much appreciate what Kimberly, who's a colleague who I haven't gotten a chance to know very well, but who's a colleague at Cal State LA, raised some questions around um, um, disciplinarity. And I think that there's some tensions around how do we include scholars or intellectuals is my preferred term, um, who have made a home in a place that is not a traditional ethnic studies discipline without eroding our disciplines. Um, so there's a reason that we've been very adamant about the four core disciplines, right? Um, there's a reason that we've been very adamant about the four core groups because as we see moving right now, there are efforts um, that are less, that are disingenuous to broaden ethnic studies in a way that it means everything so it means nothing. Right. Um, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of background um, before we move forward around ethnic studies. And I don't know if this has already been done. So today, so feel free to stop me if I'm being redundant. Um, I want to lift up that ethnic studies, the reason that it's imperative that we protect its integrity is ethnic studies is the only set of disciplines that does not come from the institution. I recently wrote a piece in the Ethnic Studies Review about this, that institutions didn't birth, birth ethnic studies, movements did, right? So if we think about 1968 and the period prior to 1968 where students, faculty, and community members um, organized themselves, put their bodies on the line in order to really disrupt um, a university system that's grounded in white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism. And at San Francisco State University, you know, they shut down the institution for four and a half months. Um, I want to lift that up because I think it's important that we also, um, as we talk about decolonization, decolonize that narrative, which has been appropriated by the institution um, in the form of community engagement. So they like to tout this idea of community engagement, which is really something different than 
um, our approach. Our approach is not one of community engagement. Our approach is one that recognizes that real knowledge and intellectual endeavors have to be grounded with community, right? That even though some of us find our homes in institutions or find our current place in institutions like Cal State LA, like Northridge, like Fresno, um, they are in fact not our homes, right? That everything that we should be doing should be done for the betterment of our people. And so we do very deep intellect, intellectual work for the liberation of our people. So in Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA, which is my home department, um, we say that we are the intellectual arm of the revolution. And so that um, history of the work that was done by the Black Panther Party, by the Third World Liberation Front, by students, by faculty who lost their jobs. You know, I think about um, Sonia Sanchez's um, reflections of her role there. Um, that work is really um, the foundation of our, our discipline. And so it's really our set of disciplines. It's really, really important that we understand and reclaim and constantly cling to um, that history. Can you still hear me if I hit that button? Yes, okay, great. Um, and so what we've seen, and I, I just also wanna give a little bit of autobiography if that's okay. How many minutes do I have today, Seth? You are good. You have about... Oh, I have good. like 10 minutes. We're at oh, yeah, about 10 minutes. minutes. About 10, 10 okay, minutes. so I'm going to give a little bit of autobiography. Um, for me, that history was hugely important. So I'm a Black woman who was born in East Oakland, not in the hills. Um, I was born in an area called Funktown in the 1970s, right? And, you know, I'm still 29. Don't let the math fool you. Um, and for me, who came of age in the 90s, just as crack cocaine was hitting hard um, in my neighborhood, um, I was blessed and feel like it was a divine intervention that I went to the only high school in the country with a Black Studies department. I went to Berkeley High School. And so as I was being pulled into the streets, and I often say I'm an activist, I'm one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, and an original member of Black Lives Matter, which was birthed here in LA. Um, I often will tell people I've been to jail six times, but that's actually a lie. I've been to jail six times for activism. Um, I've been to jail other times for less noble reasons, right? Um, and as I was being pulled in that direction, I had ethnic studies and Mr. Navies, who was the chair of our department at Berkeley High School, on my other shoulder. So this is Ramadan season. We talk about the angels on our shoulders. And um, he was on my shoulder pulling me in a direction of intellectualism and in a direction of activism. And even though the other shoulder ultimately one while I was a teenager, um, he planted seeds. And so I dropped out of high school, um, was in and out of a lot of trouble, including jail. Um, but those seeds were planted and I wound up going to Howard University. They didn't know that I went to independent studies and that wasn't real school. So they let me in, they thought I had a 4.0 um, because that's what you get in uh, independent studies. And um, those seeds enabled me to really kind of ground myself in as an, a, a scholar activist. And I majored in African American studies and I often say, and it's very difficult for me to say it without becoming emotional, that ethnic studies literally saved my life. Um, it literally saved my life. My cousin who was raised with me was literally killed um, the summer between high school and college. And I know that the reason that I went to Howard and did well there was because of Black studies in particular, but the way in which ethnic studies not only fills in subject matter, but values my experiences as a Black woman, 
um, and encourages me to not just deepen myself through books, but say, well, what are you going to do about it? You have to not do community engagement, but you can't be an African-American studies scholar. You can't be a Pan-Africanist without spending the bulk of your time in liberation work with your community and bringing your students with you. So fast forward, so I go to Howard, wind up um, going to USC for graduate school and get my first job at Cal State LA where I still am, five minutes or so, yeah. Um, and um, become kind of um, someone whose commitment to the field really grows my department. So Kimberly talked about vibrant departments. Let me say in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, um, Cal State LA was doing everything that it could to starve and strangle, especially Pan-African studies, because it's also a campus that's grounded deeply in anti-Blackness. So when I arrived, I was one of two faculty members. Um, there was one major and two minors, and there were no general education classes. Through work of the students and Black faculty, um, we were able to grow the department and create some GE courses, which gave some life, renewed life to the discipline. By 2014, Black Lives Matter had been born um, and it was birthed. Um, half of the original members were faculty and staff from Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. And I mean, not Black Lives Matter LA, I mean the entire Black Lives Matter movement was birthed through our work. And what the, that work did and what that moment did, what the year from 2013 to 2014 did is remind us of our own power. And so on campus, we were, were converting from some quarters to semesters. And every other chair, by then I was a department chair, every other chair was jockeying for um, uh, increased positioning for more general education classes. And I did the same thing that every chair did and said, ethnic studies should be a requirement. And I thought, saw this as a moment and the students saw it as a moment. And so that campus erupted and black students, black faculty, along with very courageous um, community members like Carlos Montes and very uh, courageous um, colleagues, not from our campus, but from other campuses like Teresa, right, um, helped to support the call for an ethnic studies requirement on our campus. We ultimately were undermined and we lost um, that fight on campus because of people who wouldn't move in operational unity. Um, and so we won a race and ethnicity requirement. But we didn't stop there. We took our fight to LAUSD. Um, and there was a, a comrade, Jose Lara, who had ushered in the first ethnic studies requirement in Ran uh, El Rancho Unified, but helped with the fight um, along with UTLA, along with Community Coalition. At LAUSD, we kept shutting down board meetings and we won an ethnic studies requirement the very next year in LAUSD, which was the first large school district to adopt ethnic studies as a requirement. I want to end with our current fight. That, um, and I hope that you can see that there's um, a pattern in this, that nothing in ethnic studies has been won without a fight, without a struggle that's grounded in community. So we didn't give up the idea that ethnic studies is as necessary for our students in the CSU and in the university system more broadly as math, as uh, English, as science, right? Why should kids have to take, I'm sorry, why should students have to take two lab sciences but not have to take ethnic studies? And so we began pushing, continued to push for that. Every um, piece of the university administration fought back. Um, and finally, um, when one of our own was elected to the state legislature, Shirley Weber, Dr. Shirley Weber, who's the former chair of Africana Studies at, Cal at San Diego State, um, we were able to get her to carry a bill 
to make ethnic studies a requirement in the CSU. And we tried first about two years ago to pass that bill. Um, it got put on hold and we agreed to move it forward um, beginning in 2019. Um, we, it's called AB 1460 or the bill number is AB 1460. And so we're continuing to push it forward. Um, however, you know, it's kind of COVID-19 has kind of put all legislation that's not COVID related on hold. Here's what we're facing in the midst of it is as that bill is on hold, the academic Senate, which is absolutely one of the most white supremacist bodies you can imagine, um, is conspiring with the chancellor's office to undermine ethnic studies. And what they've done is propose a resolution that collapses ethnic studies with every other kind of otherized studies, right? So with women's studies, disability studies, um, sexuality studies, justice studies, and anything related to social justice. So if you think about departments, especially mainstream departments on your campus, that means anything. One of the fights we were in in 2014 was when history said any historian can teach ethnic studies because we've all taken a class on um, uh, race, class, and gender, right? And so what we're doing in this moment is trying to protect the integrity of ethnic studies in the CSU. And there's a parallel fight in the K through 12 system where non-practitioners, non-scholars are attempting to disrupt what ethnic studies is by inserting that Jewish studies is ethnic studies when pretty much every Jewish studies scholar says, no, they're religious studies, they are not ethnic studies. And so this is why it's really, really imperative that we protect the integrity of ethnic studies, especially in this moment. I wanna end with this because at, the, at, our, at my core, um, I'm an intellectual, um, I do intellectual work, but I'm really an organizer. So on Tuesday, the Board of Trustees is set to hear an informational item on um, this ethnic studies resolution. Regardless of where you are, regardless if you think the disciplines are too narrow or not, you know that social justice broadly will be terrible for the integrity of ethnic studies. We need everybody to be prepared to speak at the Board of Trustees on Tuesday. It will only take you literally 60 seconds because that's all you're gonna be given time to meet, to, to speak for. If you are willing to make your voice heard, please email us. And I don't know if the chat is opened up, but if not, um, maybe you can email, um, email us um, and I'll give out my email address or I'll give out CFA's email address and let us know if you're available on Tuesday morning between nine and 10 a.m. Literally, your comment only can be 60 seconds, so you don't even have to put aside the whole hour, but we need you to do this so that we can protect the integrity of ethnic studies. Remember, if you're, in, if you're part of the K through 12 system, the majority of your teachers come through Cal States, and so you are a part of this. This affects you, and so we need all hands on deck, and thank you. I'm sorry for speaking too long. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move um, into a um, into a presentation now um, by uh, Mary Levi, who is a classroom teacher and a leader in K twelve education on ethnic studies and, and in particular uh, the struggle for equity and education for American Indian students. Mary, are you on? I'm on, but I needed to unmute myself. <laughs> Hi, Teresa. Hi, good to see you, Mary. It's good to see you. Thank you so much. I'm very humbled to be here and have this and be part of this panel, which is so dynamic. Let me give you a little bit of background of who I am. So I am um, Hopi from the Snow Clan of, of the village of Shongolpavi in Arizona. My husband is Robert Levi from the um, Coyote clan in Torres Martinez, Coahuila. 
And I say this because I pay respect to all of my California Native people who have fought the fight for, for any type of education in our public schools, whether it be in colleges, junior colleges, um, elementary and preschool. And because relationships are important, and especially when you are teaching and taking a look at Native studies, relationships, patriarchal, matriarchal, all of the relationships among our environment and a relationship among those that we walk, walk these lands with. So as you have said, Teresa, my ultimate goal is always to see accurate um, uh, curriculum for all students in K through 12 on American Indian Alaska Native uh, curriculum. And I've done this and I've talked to many people in um, California Teachers Association, the National Education Association. But here's the thing is that California has 109 tribes, recognized tribes. And of course, we have 78 to 80 tribes petitioning for recognition. So we even have some that are un, um, unrecognized. And then we have four regions of California and all these tribes, rancherias, bands, and, nation, and nations all have different languages, cultures, traditions, and living traditions. And then yet our current curriculum in elementary education starts at third grade. And then even then it dabbles into your neighboring tribes. And then it goes into fourth grade and I won't even get into the mission thing, but then students learn about religion, uh, regions and tribes that live there. So if only the K-12 or even preschool would even still build in that a cult curriculum of Native people on their relationship to our environment or their world, then you would always get their, the understanding and the respect of their songs, their stories, the children who are growing up. And yet we don't have any of those. And, and I don't want to say all but a majority of our teachers in elementary school don't even have the background for understanding where do you start? What do you do? How, what, what do I do that it could be uh, respectful? And so when you talk about, when you talk about um, teacher education, that is the most, that, at this point, that's the most important part of educating our teachers to get into uh, who are teaching our elementary students. And then I want to say that we have a tendency in elementary school to perpetuate all of the stereotypeness of our native people well, by wearing buckskins, wearing feathers, having teepees. And we see that in where do we get our curriculum from? teacher pay teacher, um, workbooks that are sold in uh, teacher stores. These are all a problem because then we have, we have an access problem of current or good curriculum. And that's the problem that we see that as we go through. Currently the work for ethnic studies is in our public schools are targeted towards middle school and high school. And we are educators that are on all levels need to know the relationships are key, are key term. But even then in our high schools and middle schools, we need to also see that the tribal government or tribal, um, um, tribal relationship with our government needs to be adhered to because otherwise we're still going to have the fight like Standing Rock, like, um, and our curriculum and invisibility, and we're still going to be the very um, unidentified students in our, in our, um, in our schools. The other problem with our curriculum and our teacher education is that our students don't see teachers like us. My first teacher who was native was in my junior college. And that teacher was my own father who taught history. So I'm very fortunate in my journey at, through education. But other than that, who else taught native history? It weren't, they were not natives. And so 
to get our children to be excited about school. We need to learn about boarding schools. We need to learn because it's only a generation away. We need to learn about what, um, why school was important. Otherwise, we still continue to have the dropout rates that we have. And as Kimberly had said earlier, we need to have our students graduate and yet and shine, and we don't. Um, that's why you have right now students who are organizing, like with Missing and Murdered Women, uh, Standing Rock. You have people who are currently, I mean, right now with COVID, it's been phenomenal about our, how our students are organizing on their songs. I, I am a, a student, but I also dance powwow dance. I'm a student. I also sing bird. I mean, and they're just uh, flooding Facebook. And it's great. But we do they do that in our schools? They're still not being identified. And our teachers don't recognize it. Our teachers don't see that. So personally, I think that if we stay, say it's okay to tell our younger students in California that, Cal that, Cal that California, California's past and acknowledge that history almost wiped out our native people, then it should be okay. And then, which would lead to another part, which would be the teacher education program. And that's, you know, again, the teaching, uh, the teacher credential, if we can do, if we can do justice for that, if with especially native, um, native studies, then we, then we would be at least one more step closer to um, educating our teachers in our public schools. And I think that's the huge, huge problem that we have. Okay. Did I, did I take it all? Or? <laughs> well, Mary, thank well, Mary, you so thank much you for so sharing much your sharing. perspective and being with us. Okay. Um, our um, pre next presenter is also a classroom teacher in San Jose. Um, and her name is Tanya Jaco. Tanya, are you on? I am. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. Um, I want to start by saying thank you, Dr. Montano, Dr. Lopez, uh, for leading in this collaboration and bringing us all to this space um, to have this important conversation. I also want to start by acknowledging all of the educators and activists that have gone before us and laid the foundation for us to be here. Uh, for me personally, that's my grandmother, Gretchen Hamlet, who um, was my first example of an educator, community organizer, and activist. And all of us, we are all our ancestors' wildest dreams, and we honor them with our work today. So <laughs> I want us to share that. Um, I am, my name is Tanya Jaco, and I'm a proud public middle school teacher, uh, active member of the California Teachers Association, as well as the National Education Association, and a doctoral student at San Jose State. And so I come with a perspective, not only as a classroom teacher, but as well as an, an elected union leader, but also a student of our profession. And so as we engage in this, this conversation that's really important, um, I wanna start off by saying as well, uh, I'm, I can't express how proud I am to be a part of this profession and the work that our educators have done and are doing, especially in the time of this pandemic um, and this time of distance learning and where our educators have stepped up to the plate and to continue to teach and advocate during this time while managing their own crisis. Um, as proud of I, as I am to be an educator, there's some things I'm not proud of. Um, and so we're gonna just, we're just gonna get into it. Um, there's this. Um, these are also my colleagues and whom I'm not proud of. Uh, we have a high school teacher here. These are just a few of a, a few headlines. Uh, we have a high school teacher wearing blackface here, right here in the Bay Area in California. We have a middle school teacher in Florida teaching white nationalism, and then we have an elementary school teacher who looks appears to be almost the entire staff uh, who took it upon themselves to dress up and as their interpretation of Mexicans. And then the other half of them took it upon themselves to dress up as the border wall, right? Now we talk about white supremacy culture in K through 12 or just white supremacy culture in general. You know, a lot of folks tend to see this and think of this. And this actually doesn't concern me. 
just as much. It is, it's egregious, it's abhorrent, it is uh, racist, ignorant, and hateful, right? But this is not what concerns me. What concerns me is the amount of educators that we have that see this as the only way in which white supremacy culture shows up in our schools. And that's the dangerous part. So where might white supremacy culture show up? Um, glad you asked. Uh, we are a profession that's driven by data. So let's look at some data. Uh, we know that our students are, com are extremely diversified, yet with that only 20% of our educators are educators of color. We are acutely aware that our black and brown students are disproportionately represented in our discipline data. Uh, yet when we look at this specific example, black students make up 15, about 15% 15 of our student population, yet 31% of our black students who are arrested. I didn't mess that up, arrested. We are literally, we're not sending students to the, to the principal's office, we are sending them from our classrooms into the criminal justice system. And I'm gonna leave that right there for further discussion at another time. Um, but the other thing that we see oftentimes, even districts when they're, they're aware of this, they still will tend to focus on males. And so a district might say, hey, we need to focus on Latino males or black males. And so our black girls are, are going uh, silent and unnoticed. And so that's what Monique Morris talks about in her book, Push Out. If you didn't get the book, get the book, get the book, get the book, um, where she highlights this intersection of racism and sexism, right? So black girls make up about 16% of our student population, yet they make up 42% of the, the students who are, the girls who are expelled and left to their own devices at home and without access to educational resources. So for my colleagues who are watching, who might look at this data and especially say, well, I would never wear blackface, um, we have to look at this data, we have to come face to face with this data and say, what am I doing or not doing to contribute to these numbers? What is it about our system that is yielding these results? And so when we talk about white supremacy culture, the reality is a lot of K through 12, well, I'll say people in general, but I'm speaking specifically for K through 12, um, don't necessarily have an understanding of white supremacy culture or, or have the language. And so it becomes incredibly hard to see because the longer you swim in a culture, the more invisible it becomes, right? So uh, if we look at white supremacy culture and its characteristics, there are more than 10, but I'm going to just highlight a few for us right now. When we see the sphere of open conflict, right? This is this uh, where someone raises an issue and we don't, they don't focus on the issue. That person who raised the issue then becomes the target, becomes problematic, becomes the one who created a hostile work environment. Um, defensiveness, where we have, uh, it's not just the defensiveness and attitude, but defending the power structures, right? So if you look at an organizational structure, it's defending, it has clear who's in power and who gets to stay in power, as well as the climate and culture that's created then becomes about, uh, you know, it's this oppressive culture where people are afraid to speak up. People are afraid to call things out because they're afraid of the backlash, right? That they might get fired. They don't want to rock the boat. Um, they're afraid uh, of uh, having some type of consequence for speaking up. And there's also this sense of urgency. Right? We all feel a sense of urgency, but when it comes to white supremacy culture, what we're talking about is justifying the need to shut out and close out the people who should be a part of the conversation, right? Where you see people in power, a small group of people making decisions that are going to impact uh, people who they have intentionally left out and circumventing the entire democratic process. All right, so what happens is, is because we don't want to see this, because we don't know, we haven't been taught to see this, this tends to get looked over and we recognize that there's some kind of problem. And then what ends up happening is we see this push for equity and inclusion, right? So we see all these initiatives, the higher teachers of color, wonderful. But we're not looking at what those teachers of color actually have to face once they come into the profession, right? So you have teachers of color that come in and they start calling things out. And then what happens? They then become the target. Um, and so what we also have to look at is the, not only the percentage of teachers of color, but the rate in which teachers of color are leaving the profession, which is higher than their white counterparts. Why is that? Now, teachers of color, we know why that is, but we're going to move on. 
Uh, culturally responsive pedagogy. You know, there's this need and, and push for inclusion and representation, which again is wonderful. But if your idea of representation and celebrating someone's culture is having your elementary school students dress up as pilgrims and Indians for a Thanksgiving Day parade at your school, that's a problem. We've missed the mark, right? We also see when it comes to discipline, uh, positive behavior interventions and support. Every district, every school has some form of PBIS program, right? And I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad or there are not benefits to that, but what we're really not paying attention to is this underlying current that's basically saying we're teaching students how to stay in line. We're teaching compliance. We're teaching them not how to not buck the system, right? And so we just have some missteps. And I want to point out another book that I think everybody should get if you haven't already. We want to do more than survive uh, abolitionist teaching and the pursuit of educational freedom by Bettina Love. We don't have time to get into it, but it's get the book, get the book, get the book. Uh, she says something really important, which is education can't save us. We have to save education. And I believe that that's what we're doing here. These are our efforts uh, as we talk about ethnic studies. Um, there's another misstep that I want to point out. And this is where I need folks to pay attention. All right, to my administrators who are watching, to my curriculum specialists, coaches, counselors, teachers, uh, lean in, get close, get close to the speaker. Uh, I need us to understand, you ready? Multicultural studies is not ethnic studies. Ooh, I know somebody clutched their pearls on that one. That shook somebody's world. It's okay though, it's okay, we're here. That's why we're here. We got you, we got you on this. All right, so here's what I mean. Let me, let me explain, right? Uh, multicultural studies is great. I don't, it's not, this is not a diss to multicultural studies, but if we wanna stop responding to what we see on the surface, White supremacy culture is deeply rooted in our policies and our practice. And if we want to dig down and pull that thing up by the root, then we have to be intentional. We want to move from just understanding these social inequalities and stereotypes, and we want to understand these unjust systems of power, right? We want to go from just celebrating culture and having these cultural celebrations and observances, and we need to really unpack racism, sexism, heterosexism, and classism. Um, we want to go from having, moving from just having allies, allies are great, uh, to having co-conspirators in this work. And um, to quote the illustrious and, and uh, prophetic writer, <laughs> Rihanna, when she says, uh, when it comes to our issues, we need you to pull up, this is what she means. Right. We need folks who are going to be willing to not just wear a T-shirt and share a hashtag on social media, but who are going to roll up their sleeves and get in and get in the trenches in this work. And the question is, when it comes to our issues, are you willing to put your body on the line? That'll preach right there. And I, don't, I want to stay on message, so I'm going to move on to my next point. Uh, we want to go from just having tolerance and acceptance to really disrupting the system and creating real systemic change because that is in fact what is creating the problem. Um, we want to go from having equality to equity uh, to having liberation. We want to be free. We want us to all be free. And I believe that ethnic studies not only as a way of affirming our students and, and building self-confidence and engaging in, in civic engagement um, or or teaching critical thinking, but it's also a way of us to tell the truth. And we, this is another important part, and I need us as educators to get this in our soul, that we as educators have an ethical responsibility to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help us God. And so I believe that Ethics Studies is gonna help us to do that. Now, as we move forward um, and we continue in the conversations about ethnic studies uh, in K through 12 with fidelity. There, there are three things, a lot of things, but just three things I think that need to be a part of our continuous discussion and dialogue, which is, you know, the part about needing grade level curriculum, right, for pre-K through 12. I know the focus and the emphasis is on high school and even uh, for our CSU, but what does the curriculum look like in a pre-K classroom? What does it look like in a third grade classroom, right? And not, not multicultural studies, but what does ethnic studies look like. Number two, also uh, the need for ongoing racial equity training for all educators. 
we're a product of our own institution and educators are gonna need the support and understanding their own implicit bias. This is gonna take work on an ongoing basis. Um, they're definitely going to need support as it, as when it comes to understanding the system, uh, ways that they've internalized their own oppression and continue to perpetuate this system. Um, and so that's something that's going to need to be done for all educators. And then as we examine and revise teacher credentialing, pro teacher credentialing programs, really considering how are we preparing educators to come into the field? Um, a lot of teachers wouldn't mind teaching ethnic studies, but they simply don't know how. And so asking what does that process, what does the credentialing process look like, as well as are we training educators to come into the field uh, using this racial justice lens. And those are my three points for keeping fidelity at the forefront as we continue the dialogue. And then the last thing I just want to share, especially for those watching at home, um, is there's two places where you can get additional resources. So ethnicstudiesnow.com, savecaliforniaethnicstudies.org. Um, those are two places where you can stay up to date on legislation, find petitions, but also uh, get access to resources uh, for our dish doing amazing work, San Francisco Unified, LA Unified, um, who are sharing their work with us. So that's all I have to share for right now. Again, Dr. Montano, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you, ABD Jaco. We appreciate this presentation. Um, so our final presenter, and, and then we'll do a few more Q&A, is um, our, my um, colleague and co-conspirator at Cal State Northridge, uh, Dr. Stevie Reese. Stevie? Hi. OK, let me share my video. Oh my god. I think I closed it. I, okay. Uh, there we go. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk about injustice in ethnic studies. Um, and just first I want to thank with the organizers and my co-panelists and um, just amazing words that I've learned tremendously this past hour and a half and last two hours. So um, what I want things I want to kind of root of the conversation is, is what is, what is environmentalism and what is its relationship or its roots to environmental justice and why is it important for us to care about the environment? So a lot of times people say, oh, well, to care about the environment means that you, you're whitewashed or you're, you're, you know, um, you're coconut, um, whatever they're going to call you. But um, that is rooted in a kind of um, ideology that it is true that the mainstream environmental movement has been rooted in an idea that is um, sublimed by whiteness uh, and usually rooted in the idea that you're upper middle class and therefore you can have access to the wilderness or nature and that therefore you can change the world by what you buy and not what you do. And in doing so, the idea is that, oh, if I buy my way into a green life, um, if I get a, a Prius or I get whatever, then I recycle, then that becomes, that's my contribution to the environment. And traditionally, this method has been a very narrow approach to thinking about environmentalism. And in fact, has been rooted in racism and xenophobia and anti-native politics. Uh, and colonialism. And one of the problems with the, this white liberal approach to environmentalism is it has lacked an anti-racist critique of environmental injustices. So if you actually look at the history of the National Park Service, this is the Stephen Mather party, for example, where uh, Chef Tai Sing, who is a famous Chinese cook, is, this is actually in 1915, the first, um, kind of, this is the inauguration of the Yosemite Park, the National Park Service. And one of the great issues that conservationists have been trying to grapple with is how do we recruit and invite people of color into a movement that has been historically racist and, and xenophobic and, and anti-Native and anti-Black um, and, and anti-Asian. And so, in 2013, for example, 
um, Michael Brunet, who was the became the director of the Sierra Club, decided that he would uh, take on this mantle of uh, talking about immigrant rights. And it was the first time in American history that an environmental organization, a mainstream one, had taken up a, a explicitly racist, uh, anti-racist agenda. And, um, and as a result, in 2014, the Sierra Club then um, proceeded to also endorse the Black Lives Matter movement because uh, Michael Brunet and many people on the board um, had seen that there was a grave inequity and that, that these issues needed to be at the forefront of the environmental justice movement. The problem is within, within the Sierra Club is it created a split or fissure and half of the board ended up resigning um, because many of these people were still rooted in this old school model of, of, um, of environmental movements, but that were disregarded the human impact or human toll that this had, that environmental racism had on people of color. And so if we look to Flint, Michigan, for example, you can see that Legionnaire's disease has been the primary cause of the poisoning in Flint. Um, but when, one of the things I wanna propose for all of us to think about today is, what are the origins of EJ or environmental justice? And what does that actually help us to unravel in, in being able to see ourselves as, and to question, who is an environmentalist and why should we care about the environment? Um, but also how the environment has been instrumental in our worldview. So the stuff that, you know, the, 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 the epistemologies that Kimberly was talking about and Mary um, and, and also what, what Melina was talking about is, you know, how is it that our cosmologies or our worldviews are deliberately about incorporating um, both human-based models, but also acknowledging our understanding of our relationship to the land and to other species. And so there's no other place to start than in Afton, uh, in Warren County, where black people, black citizens took over the streets and confronted police officers head on for the contamination of their neighborhood, a PCB plant that was deliberately placed in their backyard to poison them. So when we hear about Flint, this is not surprising, obviously, to African Americans, but it's also not surprising that there would be a huge movement to fight against um, this environmental injustice or environmental racism. And it also is no surprise as well that police brutality has been instrumental in how people of color have been historically brutalized. So if we look at Afton, Warren County, it was teenagers, parents, who had been chartered into the from on school buses that were fighting and literally laying their bodies on the ground. And so this parallels with the long tradition of the black radical tradition, I think, that environmentalism has always been an instrumental part in how black people also thought of liberation, but also thought about um, human rights and, and human well-being. This also parallels, and I wanted us to think about the comparative and relational nature of ethnic studies. I think we've been talking a lot about, you know, um, these big ideological moves in the field, such as settler colonialism or U.S. empire. But I also think it's important to see what we have in relationship to each other and how common our goals are in an anti-racist worldview. And this is actually out of Chavez Ravine. So I show this, I start off my classes with this image and I said, well, why does this matter the environment? Um, and then I talk about how, um, you know, this family, this Mexican-American family was driven out of Chavez Ravine neighborhood to build um, the Dodger Stadium. And what people, and I always try to get them to think about is, look at who are the actors that are deliberately enacting violence against the community. So that's for one, who are the agents of violence? It's, it's the police. And second, whose land is being dispossessed once again? And how does that get us to think about these big ideas like settler colonialism so that we can also think about what is Mexican Americans and Mexican people's relationship to settler colonialism and also to our relationship to land and land rights because we also have been a community that has been historically colonized twice or even three times because also we've intermarried also with, with many of the Tongva and Gabrielino as well over time. 
And it was people of color that risked many of their lives in that neighborhood that day. So when I talk about uh, EJ or environmental justice, I always talk about people like, what are people being removed from? Why are they being removed? And for what interest, right? So it'd be racial capitalism in the, in the event of Dodger Stadium. And I think one of the things that also is important is to begin to connect the local to the global, which is what goes back to what Robin was getting at is, you know, what was the kind of um, epi epistemological shift that the third world um, ideas that were emerging in the 1960s, which was the heart of ethnic studies that came out of the community, is how do they connect the, the local needs of the community also to the fight against the Vietnam War. And I also show this image of this hunger strike that takes place on the island of on Guam. And it's a really important staging protest because this is actually when the Vietnamese um, Operation New Life was beginning in 1975. But what we re rarely actually think about, refugees are just like American Indians are forced to be American citizens. And we always think of these processes such as citizenship as something that's voluntary, but we can actually understand then, well, refugees have a lot to a lot in common with American Indians because they're both made to be Americans. We, and it often, we often think that citizenship is something we want, but it's also a site where we can also think about where immigrants, for example, are fleeing environmental catastrophes right now, fleeing climate as refugees and forced to come to the United States. And this place, if you talk to many immigrants, is not the most beautiful place that they want to stay. And very often that's part of the Settler Project is to populate and to begin to convince people that this is an exceptional place to then commit further catastrophe upon the environment that will endorse a new necro or a, a death center politics that forces people to assume that this place is exceptional or special. And why that is even more important is because as folks have mentioned is inside of the United States, Native people have been actively fighting a long war to dismantle the United States. So then we can actually think about, well, what happens if we honor Native people's acknowledgements and begin to tear apart the United States internally? What if we decide to call this place the United States no longer? And I think that that's important and critical in how I envision environmental justice or EJ, because I think Native people and Black folks and, and Latinx and, and Asian Americans are really at the forefront in actually getting us to think about how this white supremacist state has been rooted in a genocidal project. And unless we turn back to whatever knowledge is rooted in our communities that existed prior to that, then we and if we turn to that old rooted white form of environmentalism, it is going to destroy the planet. So I, I want to just kind of acknowledge the work of the water protectors that's going on at Standing Rock, but also the work of most recently about the, the building of this telescope at Mauna Kea and Hawaii. And I think that these, this, what, what are the things that we have to parallel is what happens in settler colonialism is what is needed to, uh, to um, create proactively a genocidal white supremacist state. And that I think in the midst of COVID, we can see that this pandemic, if anything we can learn, is that we have to bring the environment as an epicenter question in how we think of race politics. If we no longer acknowledge that, our lives, all the, the horrific shit that white people have been doing to us has now begun to haunt them. And so because they've been experimenting on us for 500 years, it's no longer something you can contain anymore. And that's where I just want to end. Okay. <laughs> I think um, Stevie shares the, the absolute importance of the, um, the links between ethnic studies and issues of environmental justice. Um, we can do the same in terms of um, ethnic studies and issues of mass incarceration of, um, <clears throat> what Tanya did an excellent job in um, talking about issues of um, what happens to um, black youth in schools. 
Um, I'm going to get into a, a few of the questions at this point. Um, we have just a few minutes, and I think there's really only one question. And then I'm going to uh, bring this to an end, um, let you know what our next steps are. But there was one question for uh, Dr. Rodriguez. And the question was, you talked about the value of ethnic studies. How do we impress upon our administrators, colleagues, and students the value of ethnic studies? So Robin, would you be um, open to answering that question? Sure. I mean, I think that, um, uh, and there are different approaches. I mean, part of it too is like, how does this kind of actually play out in the kind of, you know, in struggle in life? I mean, I, I think, you know, part of what can be the argument is, I mean, it is about, and this is in consonant, right, with sort of how, um, Kind of the mainstream of California Department of Education, this this idea of around you know kind of the Common Core or whatever, but the you know just that we are about cultivating critical analyses, right? We are very much about cultivating um, of civic engagement, and so I mean I think if we have to cast it in the terms that is are kind of understandable and legible to these sorts of um, um, bodies, I think that those are the kinds of ways might, we might, you know, enter the conversation. But I think at the end of the day, for me, it's about the struggle. I mean, at the end of the day, it is about our bodies and putting our bodies on the line and organizing ourselves. I think some of the uh, worry I have is that sometimes approaches that are about these backroom kind of conversations with the uh, legislators or their staffers, I think that I worry that that's where the potential, the watering down and the whitewashing can continue to happen. I think we have to continue to grow this movement. Um, you know, I think that we remain vibrant as a field, as as uh, educators, scholars, when um, the these movements are are vibrant and that we're connected and embedded with them. So, I don't know if that kind of answers the question well enough, but you know, I think it's these are these are partly tactical and strategic questions in some ways, I guess. Um, in terms of how you address them in different ways uh, to kind of power the powers that be. But at the end of the day, I think the right answer is we just have to organize ourselves. That is the answer. And that is how we're going to uh, make real transformation in the ways that we want it to be made. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be us kind of um, with those answers. I think it, we have to bring our, our you know, communities to the table, youth to the table to testify to the meaningfulness of ethnic studies. That's where the answers are, in fact. I think that for any of us, um, I think a lot of us on this panel can say that ethnic studies saved us in so many different ways, because it did. And it, that is um, also, I think, I, probably the best answer, right? Because, I mean, you can make academic ar arguments, you can make all of that. In fact, the, the truth of the matter is all those arguments always fall on deaf ears, <laughs> deaf ears anyway. You know, I think we're, we're better, um, I think it's when we kind of exercise our collective power that we are forced, we force these institutions to um, concede to us. And, you know, and I think that's kind of where we need to be. Thank you. So there are um, uh, many comments in the, um, in the key, uh, most of them asking for um, uh, materials and resources. I think what we can do is we can go to the uh, presenters and ask for um, some um, recommendations and send those out to uh, many of you. Um, we, um, Melina gave us an opportunity to actually begin our organizing efforts uh, this week or next week on Tuesday. If you are interested in working on organizing that, please let us know. This is the first in a series of webinar. We want to welcome you and ask you to please register for the next series on um, May 14th, where we move into um, other issues like what and some of you asked about this in this session so we'll give you some um, real uh, examples next session what are some examples of actual collaborations on ethnic studies uh, that are currently being done in the field and the emphasis will be on uh, professional development options and also um, the second the next seminar will be on what's happening in some credentialing options that you can look at in webinar four. So webinar three will concentrate on model K-12 ethnic studies collaborations. And webinar four, can you move to webinar four because they're gonna register on that. Is that not on here? Webinar four 
will concentrate on um, some pathways that if we know existing pathways um, that uh, exist related to uh, teacher credentialing or, to, or the credentialing options. I want to thank our um, amazing panelists, um, Melina, Robin, Kimberly, Mary, Tanya, Stevie, Lupe, um, Cindy, all of you who uh, joined us today to begin this conversation and to those of you who added your voice, I am going to, um, I'm going to ask you to please, please, please fill out the evaluation form. Uh, it's critical because we're going to be designing future sessions um, based on a lot of your questions and input. And um, the final session, uh, which will be a open forum will be related to what are our next steps um, in what we need to do to make sure that we have created um, an avenue for uh, qualified, critical ethnic studies teachers. So one more announcement that I promised that I would make, um, CFA will be hosting a, uh, a webinar on um, anti-Asian violence um, with uh, that we've seen rise as a result of COVID-19 on Radio Fee Free CSU. It's a YouTube uh, podcast. We will post this in the chat room. Hopefully many of you will listen to Russell Jung, uh, who will lead a Facebook party on that discussion um, at our CFA Facebook page. So Patricia, do you have that, that we could post it on the chat? In case people... in it now, yeah, great. Okay, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you um, to colleagues who presented um, for us today. Patisa, do you want to tell them about the form so they can make sure to fill that out? Yeah, so once you exit um, out of the webinar, it'll actually prompt you with a link so you're able to provide um, your feedback. And, um, and then we'll be also sharing a lot of the uh, chat information that was provided here as well. Okay, thank you. And on that note, um, good night and thank you for being with us today. Bye. Thank you.